Hi, everyone. My name is Sophia Gross. I'm the head of policy partnerships and social impact at Snapchat. For those of you who are newer to Snap and Snapchat, we reach 90% of the U.S. population age 13 to 24. And so with that comes an awesome responsibility and huge opportunity when it comes to helping this next generation of Americans understand how they can access this beautifully complex democracy. We've always said that here at SNAP, we believe there's no more powerful form of self-expression than civic engagement. And so we've worked to help build native to mobile civic tools to help this next generation of Americans understand how to make their voice heard. We know that this next generation of Americans is the most diverse in American history. And so we want to make sure that they understand how they can use their voice when it comes to understanding how to register to vote, find out what's going to be on their ballot, and now most recently run for local office. We've always had three key key pillars to our approach to civic engagement. First and foremost, voter registration, right? And making sure that every Snapchatter across the country understands all the complexity when it comes to registering to vote, especially from their mobile friends and encouraging their closest friends to do the same. From there, we really lean into what we call voter education and really making sure that Snapchatters understand what's gonna be on their whole sample ballot before they show up to vote. I remember the first time I showed up to vote for a federal election and it felt like a test that I didn't get the chance to study for. And so I want to make sure that we're empowering first time voters to understand what that whole experience for when they show up to vote will feel like. Then finally, as we know, helping people show up is equally as important to all these parts you have to do before then. So especially during a global pandemic, making sure that Snapchatters understood all of their options for showing up, explaining to them what voting early means, what voting by mail means, what voting by a ballot drop off location means and everything and anything in between. So we built two dedicated mini experiences to help Snapchatters do just that. First, we launched Register to Vote, a mini partnered with TurboVote that was a native to mobile and native to Snapchat experience to help Snapchatters understand everything they needed to get voter registration assistance across the country. We also had a dashboard at the very top showing how many Snapchatters had engaged with this experience to really lean into the socialization of the importance of civic conversations with close friends. As you can see on the landing page here, we have the dashboard of the latest numbers for Snapchatters for when they log in and decide to engage with Register to Vote. From there, we also built Before You Vote, which is a native to Snapchat experience that helps Snapchatters look up their whole sample ballot ahead of time and also understand how to make a plan to vote. We really wanted to lean into how we know Gen Z is having these conversations, and that is through the lens of the issues they care most about. So you could toggle your entire sample ballot ahead of time to make sure that you understood which candidates were championing the issues that you cared most about. This mini was partnered with Ballot Ready. Now, most recently, we have launched our latest civic initiative to help the Snapchat generation run for local office across the country. One of the biggest findings from the 2020 election is that over 70% of races went uncontested. And so we really want to help Snapchatters understand, based on the issues they care most about, how they can make a difference in their community when it comes to starting this to really invest in this next generation of American leadership. We know that only 6% of state legislators are under the age of 35. And so if this next generation of Americans wants to make sure the issues they care most about are championed, then they need to lean into what it takes to really be a leader and fight for the issues that you most care about. So we built Run for Office, partnered with Ballot Ready Civic API to really help Snapchatters understand how they can make a difference in their community based on the issues they care most about. That's why we start with that 70% statistic to help Snapchatters understand that this is a very real opportunity they can lean into when it comes to understanding how to lead in their local communities. To walk you through the experience, there will be two core functions. First and foremost, you can explore based on where you live and the issues you care about, what you can run for, or you can nominate a close friend. We know how, you know, what a big life step it is to raise your hand to run for office yourself, but we know how important the role of validators can play. So if I look at my best friend and say, hey, um, I think you should run for office because I think you'd be amazing on our local school board, that will really change the way that someone else thinks about the leadership role they might play in their local community. And so we really want to lean into the fact that Snapchat is a best friends platform, right? This isn't where anyone who you've ever met at a dinner party is coming to talk to you. This is really where you're talking to your closest friends every day. And so we know how powerful that influence is when it comes to, you know, having conversations around civic engagement, whether it be voter registration or running for local office. From there, um, again, because we know how passionate Gen Z is on the issues they care most about, we're actually going to translate what those issues really look like when it comes to real jobs in your local community. So you can toggle the issues you care most about to then understand the different positions and elections that you can run for to really make a difference and champion those issues in your local community. 
Most importantly, we want to make sure that we're setting up these Snapchatters for a real community with the key resources and tools that they need to really step in and successfully run for office. So we've partnered with 10 diverse candidate recruitment organizations that will help Snapchatters across this journey. You can pick um, a few different candidate recruitment organizations that you can work with. And once you sign up, the candidate recruitment organization will reach out to welcome you to this new journey within 48 hours to making sure that you have everything you need to embark on this next step in your civics journey. Our high level goal is to really help expand the number of people having a conversation about running for office. So that way we can have a democracy and leadership that is more reflective of the Snapchat generation. And we can't wait to see all they'll do. Thanks so much for having me.
Welcome to our talk on how to do machine learning. Uh, to get, today, together with my colleague Shrey Agarwal, we're going to take you through um, how to implement machine learning for your business problem. We're going to cover it broadly in two agenda items. Uh, the first one is making the right start, and the second is about integrating responsible AI. Most of the times when uh, machine teams are implementing machine learning, we find that there are some common challenges that they go through. Um, every data science engagement typically has two aspects to it. The first is uh, taking a mod taking the historical data and training a model to make a prediction. We are all aware of that part, but to make it successful, once you've made a prediction, once you've got a model that can make a prediction, to make it successful, the second part is equally important, which is around an intervention. To take the prediction from your model, you need to then take the prediction and implement it in a such a way that the user's journey is improved. Uh, the user experience is improved and that is able you're able to implement that decision that can make an actionable impact for the user who's uh, using the application most of the times uh, the machine learning being a new domain takes a lot of focus and the specialist data work becomes a ch central challenge on which everybody is trying to focus as a result the problem definition and adoption tends to get commoditized and uh, the value that you get from your data is minimized to be able to maximize that value, the focus really should be around defining the problem more accurately. Um, unless you define the problem specific to your business and the goals that you're trying to achieve, any model that you train will not be optimizing uh, using your data and optimizing for the right problem. I, and as a result, it would not be giving you the, result, uh, the outcomes that you're looking for. Once you've defined your problem accurately, uh, for the business goals that you are trying to achieve, then implementing these data work is mostly a commoditized operation. You, you will still have to choose the right algorithms. You will still have to go through the data life cycle, but the problem definition decides how well you are able to do that. And when you've got your model ready, then how do you make it available to the users decides how the adoption goes. And focusing on the adoption is equally important as important as defining the problem because unless it's adopted, unless the users are able to use it and enjoy using it, you don't get the right value from it. Um, and then finally, what we see is uh, that firms try to, when they start uh, enter their machine learning life cycle, they try to uh, you jump straight forward into experimentation or try and implement a model as quickly as possible. However, we believe that uh, it's really important to understand the stage of your business where you are in, the maturity of your data, and then decide how do you proceed with the uh, data from there on. If you are in very early stages of your data maturity, then determining KPIs for the business and, and trying to find segmentation of the users and basic analysis in that direction is going to be much more meaningful than trying to create, um, jump straight forward into machine learning experimentation. However, if your data is more mature, uh, then you can, start using your data to perform experimentation, uh, influence decisions on product side, launch features, or even go as far as uh, defining the strategic risks, the con constraints on your ecosystem and setting goals and strategy for your product. Now I'll pass it over to my colleague, uh, Shreya, to talk about how do you integrate responsible AI in your life cycle. Thank you, Sachin. Sachin just talked about how to build a right uh, data team and how to do machine learning the right way. The next part of this talk would talk about how to integrate responsible AI in your data science life cycle. It is very important to understand that responsible AI is an implementation technique of ethical AI. And when we talk about res responsible AI, we'd like to focus on four important things. One is secure AI, explainable AI, accountable AI, and fair AI. So talking about each of them, what is secure AI? So we must have, you must have heard about a lot of data breach, a lot of data leakage, and attacks on machine learning model. So secure AI just does not talk about securing or differentially privatizing your data, but also machine learning model. Techniques in which nobody would be able to identify your data, even with some inputs or some hints about your personal information, but also securing the, the model in a way that anything which goes inside the model is differentially private. 
anything which the model learns is differentially private and anything which comes out of the model is again differentially private the next one which which is also very important is accountable ai most of the time after uh, a machine learning model is deployed we think that the job is over the job actually starts from that very moment accountable ai would ensure that the model in production is still valid for usage it does it has not decayed uh, in 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 given time so accountable ai talks about monitoring the uh, the model monitoring the data and monitoring the outcome so it talks about the data drift the concept drift the model accuracy drift and other important aspect including explainability and fairness drift in the model which can happen uh, given changing dynamics in the world changing macro and microeconomics environment changing behavior pattern and so on and so forth the next one which is one of the most pertaining or pressing is issues of the moment is fair ai we have heard a lot about how ai or ml model are discriminatory there there are cases where women of of some color or a single mother are denied loans or people of some ethnicity have to pay a higher interest rate or a machine learning algorithm recognize face of some colored people very very accurately while of other segment not very accurately there has been cases where a uh, historical bias has been learned by the machine and it is it is it is visible in the decision they take right now so fair ai talks about two things number one detecting discrimination in the model and number two mitigating those discrimination in the model fair ai goes beyond simple fairness it talks about very very interesting metrics like equal opportunity demographic parity equalized odds which which does not talk about the accuracy of the model but also talks about are we penalizing both the group of people say male or female or married men men versus single uh, women in the same uh, form or not in the same pattern or not with the same degree of penalization or not and similarly when you talk about reward same same amount of reward or not <clears throat> the fourth thing which we talk about is explainable ai explainable ai uh, is something which has been talked about since years or maybe a decade however explainable ai just not end by talking about what happens inside the model it starts with explaining every feature which goes inside the model and that explanation has to be in a very very simple english then goes into what does the model do how does it do what are the calculation that happens and finally the prediction outcomes but however it still does not end here it also should talk about counterfactual explainable that is what should i do in order for the machine to reverse its decision that's also a very very pertaining issue so when you talk about all these three or four things together that makes responsible ai again secure ai which secure your data make it differentially private accountable ai continuous model monitoring ensure that the model has not decayed and still fit for use <laughs> fair ai to ensure that there is no discrimination and explainable ai to ensure that the end user end customer understand what happens before during and after the modeling and using all this concept we also have written a book on responsible ai published by springer re released recently and I, and this concept are talked about in details in that book thank you so much
I work with a lot of local government staff, and people often comment on the PIT stick sticker that I have on my laptop that reads, digitizing a broken process gives you a broken digitized process. Side note, New America folks, I need more of those stickers. Despite this recognition that digital does not equate to better, the term public interest technology is innately techno-solutionist. It emphasizes the importance of technology solutions in public or civic problems. So I want to share a few examples of the value of understanding the underlying information problem in civic projects that I've worked on. Since 2013, the Citizen Interaction Design Program, or CID, has built information tools that support and promote civic engagement. We connect students in user experience design with local governments to redesign civic interfaces. Something we came to realize early on in CID is that the technology first approach wasn't working. Community partners weren't ready to maintain many of the technology solutions we designed, and neither were we. Converting a student designed prototype into a functioning mobile app is a time consuming and expensive process. If the community partner didn't know how to keep the app hosted in an app store, that was the end of the project. The lights were out before the storefront opened. Also, by focusing on technology solutions, we were ignoring the problems that residents were experiencing. If we start by building a website, we reduce the resident's experience to a problem that a website solves. We were falling into a trap of solving problems that no one had while ignoring people's real needs. So based on hiccups in our early efforts and what we heard from our community partners, CID established three principles for our work. Con be context aware. So we build for the capacity we have. We understand that the city staff are not aiming to be technically advanced. They're aiming to provide services enforce rules and build better communities. For example, proper identification is critical for accessing support and services from government and community providers. Yet, people living with a, without a home struggle the most to secure and maintain proper ID. In a project with service providers in Jackson, Michigan, we just discovered that some of these challenges could be addressed by sharing information across agencies. We could increase the services available to people without getting them identification because collectively these agencies could verify enough information to help in many cases. That's a good thing because creating new pathways to obtaining official identification includes extensive work with multiple government systems, way more than students were able to take on in a semester, and it was also more than our com community partners were prepared to deal with. The student team instead presented an elegant solution, a Google spreadsheet shared between organizations. This was a tool that staff was already familiar with, and it was simple and easy to set up. They also didn't need to purchase or subscribe to any new systems. The second principle that we focused on was being citizen-centered. We focused on understanding and providing for citizens' experience as opposed to that of city staff, administration, or elected officials. This approach leverages the skills students are learning in class, and human-centered design is all but unknown to most of our government partners. They don't have time, expertise, or budget for this work, so we could provide a high-value service. In addition, university students can ask questions and express curiosity with people in a way that's not possible for government staff. The students benefit from a presumed neutrality that city staff doesn't always get. For example, the city of Ferndale asked us to look at complaints residents were reporting about raking leaves. In the autumn, Ferndale residents rake their leaves into the street where a city truck comes by and picks them up on a posted schedule. Problems arise when one neighbor rakes early, leaving piles of leaves that block the street. Meanwhile, another neighbor rakes late, resulting in their leaves blowing into the yard of the early raker. And at the same time, someone parks on top of the leaves raked into the street just in time for the collection truck to pass by, leaving those leaves uncollected. The city asked us to figure out how to improve neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor communication and collective action. 
But it turned out that the residents' perspective was very different. They saw this as a lack of communication about the leaf pickup schedule. Well, the city felt they were clearly communicating the schedule via a citywide map, that message wasn't reaching neighbors. The centralized focus of the information wasn't working for residents. So we flipped the perspective and created a simple way to enter an address and see a schedule of all the leaf pickup dates for a single location. Now it was easier for residents to find the information that mattered most to them when the leaf collection truck was passing by their house. The technology solution was not complicated and it turned out that we could provide more information like snow plowing and trash and recycling pickup and construction projects and special events through the same interface. The lesson was to focus on user research to understand the diverse perspectives and common needs of the community. The third principle that we focused on was being problem oriented. So we don't enter a community armed with a website and a mobile app anymore. We commit to understanding the information problem and then design a way to reduce that problem instead of asking how to solve every problem through the app store. For example, rats are one of the least welcome community members and Ferndale residents were complaining about them on Facebook. So the city asked us to explore how they might redirect community frustration to contribute to a solution. How could residents help fix the problem? After speaking with residents, we came away with a new perspective. This wasn't a rat problem. This was an information problem. The main way rat to report rats was to call the city. However, the number to call was for a person that was in the field all day long dealing with those complaints. So messages were left, often incomplete or unclear. And phone tag went back and forth too long and people eventually got frustrated and turned to complaining on Facebook, where the angry mob was forming now. So we created a better way to communicate through Rat Chat, a texting app that provides simple recommendations to get rid of rats and an easy way to report problems. All the reports were logged into a spreadsheet that helped staff keep track of calls and follow up more efficiently. This technology solution depended on us first devoting time and resources to understanding the problem. Many of the failures of technology solutions are the result of assuming that the stated problem is accurate and correct. And if we build before we test these assumptions and try to understand the problem, we're just building digitized broken systems. Let's consider the problem-centered approach a bit more broadly. I told you three success stories from student projects out of over a hundred attempts that we've had. Not all of them were successful. We missed the mark many times. But over time, we saw that individual projects were not where we were having the most impact. Where CID was, the mo was having the most long-term impact was our influence in the culture of the organizations we worked with. A city manager told me one day that as he was walking down the hall, he overheard someone explaining that they had a CID problem. They needed to get the citizen's perspective on this. CID partners have started user testing their websites. They've implemented open data portals, and they've come back to us more with more and more ways they think we can help them explore civic information challenges. This is a fundamental different, fundamentally different approach than shopping for a new online tool to manage civic engagement. They are moving beyond seeking high-tech solutions to broken systems and instead seeking to understand the information problems behind them. There will always be a role for academic institutions to contribute to these efforts. I see no end to, lift, to the list of projects that we can work on with our community partners. And as we consider new projects, we will continue to look for the ones that provide an opportunity to understand the underlying information problem instead of simply digitizing broken tools, services, and systems. Thanks. Hello, 
Better Tech, thank you so much for having us today. We're really excited to talk to you about how we think about product in terms of government services. So we'll talk to you about a couple of different things today. The first is why government services need tech in the first place. The second is how product managers in particular are really essential to delivering these next level digital government services. And then the last part, we'll talk about a little bit about what we do at Ad Hoc. So a quick introduction, my name is Imani Farouk. I'm the product manager on search.gov, which is a search engine for federal agencies. And I'm Sophia Tureen. I'm a product manager with the Department of Veterans Affairs, working on databases and APIs. So why does government services need tech in the first place? You might think the government is really in the business of actually selling a sort of product or service. So why would it need a next level technology approach to deliver these services? Well, think about all the ways that you interact with government, whether it's going to the DMV, finding a COVID testing center, or requesting a mail-in ballot. All of these actions are really similar to services that are available already in the private sector, and those experiences typically have a much better user interface and much more intuitive design than these government experiences do because they have the resources and product thinking to constantly iterate. Um, we would argue that it's probably even more important to apply this technology approach in the public sector because people are really looking for these services in times of distress and need. And because of that, it's really important that one, we serve the broadest swath of people available, and two, we make that experience really intuitive and easy for them to follow. Let's look at a specific example. One really good example that comes to mind is COVID testing services. We'll look at one public sector example with the District of Columbia, and one private sector example with a company called Curative. And when I'm looking for COVID testing services, I do really want to answer two main questions. One, where are those services? And two, when can I go to get those services? Both of these answer those same questions, but you can see in very different ways. When I look at the government of the District of Columbia's website, I see, um, one, a pretty long page. I see information in a table about different sites, but I don't necessarily see their location relative to me. And it's very unclear what they serve and at what times do they serve that, uh, that population. If I'm patient and I scroll all the way down, then I do see this image about all the places that are available uh, on this particular day. Um, and during which time frames. But again, this is also an image, so it's not very interactive, not something that if I were using a screen reader, I would actually be able to read. So contrast that with this experience in with Curative. Um, I can see, I can navigate this map, I can see where these testing centers might be, and I can also see what services they offer and what slots might be available. And this is a much better, more intuitive way to find testing centers than the one previously. So how can we get those District of Columbia, those government sites, to be more like these private sector examples that have a really intuitive way to navigate these services? We believe that product managers are essential in closing this gap to develop effective digital government services. And we have four principles that we keep in mind. The first is that we think in terms of products to evolve rather than projects to manage. We define success in terms of outcomes for people rather than output delivered. We work cross-functionally from start to finish rather than in siloed research design and engineering phases. And lastly, we apply tools like agile and user-centered design to explore problems rather than build exclusively from requirements. And we'll go into each of these in more detail throughout this presentation. The first principle is a shift from project-based thinking to product thinking. And we think of these in two different ways. With a project, you typically have a very sequential waterfall approach where you start thinking about what you're going to do, planning how to do it, doing that thing, and then moving on to the next. However, with product, we think of this as more of a cycle, and we continue to repeat those cycles, getting us closer and closer um, to the ultimate end goal of being able to better deliver services for our customers. And through each of these phases, we take it more of a discovery and learning approach rather than an output-driven model. And that leads us into principle two. Why is it so important that we focus on outcomes rather than outputs? Well, we think of ourselves as doctors versus waiters. And what we mean by that is that with a waiter, you typically are responding to explicit requests, you coordinate with the kitchen and staff to get that done, and you're evaluated on how well you do according to those tasks as well as how fast you do it. 
However, with a doctor, you come to a doctor with a problem. That doctor diagnoses that problem, evaluates a couple of different methods and different ways to solve that problem, um, and eventually the doctor is evaluated on how well they make you feel better and how well they solve your initial issue. So in that way, we really approach each product problem, each problem in government uh, with that doctor mindset. So I'm going to speak about how we as product managers are making this happen. For public services that are as critical as finding a COVID test or enrolling in really any kind of public assistance, maybe it's for Medicaid health insurance or filing your FAFSA form for a student loan, we as product managers care a lot about the user experience. And we believe that we can build the best products not by having organizational decisions siloed and then passed down to development and design teams, but by truly working cross-functionally. And product managers are at the intersection of that work. So for example, let's say we are working on a product that could be a website, an app, really any digital service that the government is offering. And here we are looking at the product development journey. So starting on the left-hand side, we as product managers might start off by working with organizational leaders to define the product strategy. But we know that we need to use the expertise of the user experience team because they are the ones who are interviewing our end users and really identifying the pain points to help us prioritize against the various problems that we want to tackle. We also know that we need to work with our engineering teammates because they have the technical expertise to help us identify technical opportunities as well as any potential trade-offs we need to consider as we're building this product out. So product managers are driving these conversations forward and ensuring that this is not a linear process, it's not a project that we will complete, but instead it's, it's a product that will truly evolve and involves continuous discovery and learning from our end users to ensure that we're truly delivering value to them. And lastly, I want to speak with you about equity and accessibility. So unlike the private sector, which might build a product for a specific user group, maybe targeted based on their age or their sex or any other demographic, the government must build services and products for all. And that can certainly be a challenge for product managers, but we can accomplish it by leveraging agile and human-centered design practices. That means that we are maintaining a constant feedback loop where we're measuring and learning how we're doing, but it also means that we are tackling problems that are as diverse as the populations that we serve in the US. It also means that we are incorporating accessibility standards from the start of the development process rather than treating it as an afterthought or as a nice to have. And we know that that is incredibly important when serving the general public because when we, when we do our user research, we seek a broad sample group. And that tells us that inclusive design and usability is incredibly important to ensuring that we are truly serving the entire public. So Amani and I have just walked through some of the key principles for why we believe product managers are essential for effective digital government services. And that's exactly what we do at Ad Hoc. So Amani and I work directly with government agencies to help them better serve people uh, through technology. And we've had incredible success. So Ad Hoc is a leader in product management in the government. We were actually born out of the healthcare.gov rescue in 2013, and I encourage you to go to our website to learn more about that incredible story. And we help agencies across the government today to build digital services for people that raise the expectation of what is possible in government. So to me, that really means that we are bridging the gap between what people expect in the private sector and what is possible in government. And Imani talked about outcomes and how much we care about those at Ad Hoc. So here are some exciting numbers to share. We work on healthcare.gov and since joining, we've seen a 106% increase in application completions compared to the previous system. We also work on VA.gov. I actually work with the VA and we have seen a 54% reduction in wait times for veterans with disability claims that are being processed. We've also seen a 32% improvement for page load times on VA.gov. So Amani and I are incredibly excited about 
uh, product management in the government, as well as what we're doing at Ad Hoc. So here's our contact information. Please reach out if you have any questions, and thank you so much for watching. Hi, I'm Erhard Grafe, faculty at Olin College of Engineering. And I'm Shreya Chaudhary, a senior at Olin College of Engineering. We'd like you to try not building something. What are we talking about? Well, if we are being serious about the public interest in public interest technology, we must be willing to refuse to design certain technologies at odds with the public interest. This requires not only anticipating potential harms, but reflecting on our values and the values and voices of those who might not be represented in a project, especially during a project's early phases. Certainly when we decide on what to design, AKA the solution, but also when we arrive at and articulate the problem at hand. This is a political process. It's negotiation of shared and likely competing values that will inform design work. Technologists, especially engineers, like to believe their work is largely free of politics, that there are simply good and efficient solutions versus substandard ones. But what if we shouldn't be offering a solution to a given problem at all? What if the solution is wrong? What if the problem definition is wrong? What if we or are the wrong we to be doing something about it? Well, then we, as responsible public interest technologists, should refuse to design it. Public interest technologists must acknowledge the political dimensions of design work and make that truth part of their design practice. We call this design refusal. I learned the value and necessity of design refusal the hard way through personal experience. In fall 2019, in my sophomore year at Olin, I and a team of other students decided to refuse to build something. My team was part of Pints, a student-led public interest technology project team at Olin that I co-founded. One of our cornerstone programs is a student-led consulting clinic, which offers pro bono technical consulting to organizations working with public interest. Fall 2019 was our first semester running our program. My team connected with an anti-human trafficking nonprofit that focuses on extracting victims and preventing human trafficking. They proposed a potential tool for us to build that they believe would be useful for their work. The web scraper to scrape escort sites for ads where the posters could be potential victims of human trafficking. They had been scraping ads manually for over a year with some success and hoped the automation would allow them to identify and rescue more victims. Initially, my team and I were over the moon about the project. We would get to develop our technical skills, create a positive impact by helping people who clearly really need help and work with an organization that we respected and admired. On the surface, the project seemed to exemplify the goals of public interest tech. My team and I jumped right into implementing the web scraper, but our advisor, Earhart, raised a few questions that made us pause, step back, and question some of our underlying assumptions. The questions Earhart raised were uncomfortable. His concerns weren't focused at all on the technical implementation of the tool, but rather about our partner and the broader system. He pointed out how this tool could also collect data on voluntary sex workers without their consent and how sharing this data with the nonprofit and their law enforcement partners could be really dangerous. This line of questioning led me and my team to go back to our partner and ask them and ask them difficult questions about how they could ensure that voluntary sex workers wouldn't be endangered. Their answers felt unsatisfactory to us. So we reached out to an expert in text-based interventions to human trafficking. This expert described the, pro the problematic ways police treat both victims and voluntary sex workers and the history of harm created by policing digital sex work. What struck me most was the way she, she drew attention to the fact that our partner organization had no representation of survivors or even a connection to survivor or advocacy groups. In fact, comprised of mostly cis white men from ex-military backgrounds, the organization looked a lot more like the police than the people they wanted to rescue. Understanding the paradigms between our partner and our stakeholders fundamentally shifted my perspective of the tool we were being asked to build. I could envision the massive harm that this tool could cause, especially if applied at scale. But even after these realizations, refusal was not an obvious decision for me and my team. We deliberated for a long time, weighing lots of factors, including our personal reputations, clients' reputation, our relationship with our partner organization, our feelings of shame at quote unquote failing if we did not build the tool, and our desire and commitment to do no harm. We wondered if we could introduce a number of stipulations, for example, asking our partner to build relationships with survivors and sex worker advocacy groups 
and ensure that they would not be mistreated by the police. Perhaps this would minimize the harm. However, we realized that we could not negotiate with or compromise on our values. We weren't willing to accept minimal harm when we were committed to doing no harm. This was a red line we would not cross. So instead we took a more assertive position. We would not build under any circumstances, full stop. The decision to refuse was different from any design, any design decision I've ever made. I've changed my mind about specific implementations in many projects before. In other public, public interest tech projects, I pivoted upon realizing that a specific implementation would not be optimal for a user or might create more problems than solutions. However, refusal required me to consider the impacts of my work beyond optimal and non-optimal or problems and solutions. We instead needed to consider how needed to consider much more important impacts, specifically the potential harms I could perpetuate. To do this, I needed to interrogate the problem framing that guided the project and confront the imbalance in whose needs were heard and prioritized in defining the problem. This drew my attention to the political dynamics that the project was part of and forced me to reckon with my personal values and politics and explicitly and deliberately draw clear lines during what I was and was not willing to support. This is now core to my definition of public interest technology. My team and I are not alone in our refusal. We are part of a greater movement of refusal in tech. Over the past few years, tech workers have begun collectively refusing to participate in, in perpetuating harm. Thousands of tech workers protested and walked out in movements like the anti-Maven movement, where Googlers refused to build image recognition tracking technology for the Department of Defense, and the No Tech for ICE movement, where tech workers across the industry refused to create tools to aid ICE in mass deportations. These refusals led to transformative shifts within the tech industry. Increasingly, tech workers have begun to see themselves as loyal to more than just, the, more than just their companies or themselves. Instead, as the Tech Worker Coalition describes, tech workers work in solidarity with existing movements for social justice, workers' rights, and economic inclusion. This growing movement in technology requires a cultural transformation in how technologists, including public interest technologists, understand their professional identities and responsibilities. I believe we should ta be talking about civic responsibility. Technologists have responsibilities to the public like everyone else. Technology is infrastructure. It shapes human behavior and can transform society or even democracy. People, especially citizens in a democracy, deserve a say over what infrastructure governs their lives, whether it is built by a private company or a public institution. However, the power of being a designer and the technocratic culture pervasive in engineering related fields can be at odds with serving the public interest and observing what should be the equal say of citizens in a democracy. We need civic professionalism in technology. Scholar, organizer, and educator Harry Boyd has long argued that civic engagement includes the public purpose of professional work. He says we need citizen engineers who don't separate their citizen identity from their engineer identity. Political scientist Albert Zerr argues professionals can work in ways that exemplify democracy, embracing multiple forms of expertise, complementing specialized skills with unique perspectives of fellow citizens to solve problems. This is the negotiation of values. It's power sharing, actually. It's politics, and it should be part of public interest technology. The Design Justice Network is a powerful beacon here offering design principles that center stakeholders and advance a vision for design that is accountable to society and to justice, explicitly engaging with the question of when we should refuse to design something. So we need a movement like design justice in technology and in public interest technology, a movement that organizes us as technical professionals to ask the political questions, the uncomfortable questions, underlying the decision to build a technology or not. To get you started, here are some questions you should ask. What are my values? What are my red lines? How do I define my professional responsibility? When considering a project, ask, are we open to the possibility that the best approach is to not design anything at all? What is the challenge we are trying to address? Who had a meaningful say in defining that challenge? What systems of help or harm will this design be a part of? What are the worst case scenarios after deployment? Do these actually cover the worst case scenarios for all stakeholders? Thank you for listening to our talk. 
Please reach out to us with questions or comments about, de about designer fusel as public interest technology. We are always collecting stories of designer fusel. So let us know if you do try not building something. Hello, my name is Mary Gentilly, and I'm actually uh, delighted to have a chance to share with you today a little bit about giving voice to values, or GVV. I'm actually a faculty member at the University of Virginia, Darden School of Business, and the creator and director of Giving Voice to Values. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to share that with the better tech community. Um, giving Voice to Values is an innovative uh, approach to values-driven leadership development. I created it originally for use in, in graduate business education, MBA programs, which is where I've spent most of my professional career, 10 years at Harvard Business School, five years at Babson College, and now I'm at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business. But giving voice to values is now being used in many settings, obviously graduate business education, undergraduate business, executive education, but also increasingly in engineering education, um, legal and healthcare education and in companies all around the world, including uh, a number of technology-based uh, and engineering-related uh, uh, industries. So let me tell you a little bit about what Giving Voice to Values is. And if you want to learn more, you can just go to givingvoicetovalues.org. As I said, it's an innovative approach to values-driven leadership development. It's actually about helping people to more effectively address the kinds of values conflicts and ethical conflicts that they might encounter in their professional careers. Um, obviously in, in STEM related fields, technology related fields, you usually are often working in a business setting. So many of the kinds of challenges I face in business schools will be relevant to you. But then there's also some things that'll be specific to you because you're working with new technologies, that create all kinds of wonderful opportunities, but also can create some unexpected um, or unanticipated kinds of values conflicts. So let me just tell you quickly what GVV is. Um, uh, typically when we approach values conflicts or ethical conflicts in educational or corporate training settings, organizational training settings, we approach them as if they're entirely cognitive challenges, as if it's a matter of giving you some sort of decision-making framework, some sort of tool where you put all the information in one end, um, something happens in that black box and the right or ethical or responsible answer comes out the other end, the sustainable answer, um, and then you're done. Um, and this is often you, uh, taught by using models of ethical reasoning that come from philosophy, things like uh, deontology and utilitarianism and virtue-based ethics. It's, as I said, it's approaching values conflicts as if they're entirely cognitive. What I've found in my career over, over several decades of working in this field is that, yes, that's useful. Often these issues are complicated and you need frameworks to help you think rigorously and consistently. But that's not enough because quite often there are issues where many of us feel that we know what the right thing to do is, the ethical thing, the responsible thing, the sustainable thing, um, the inclusive thing. But just because we know that, it doesn't mean that we feel that it's possible to get it done successfully within our organizations or our, or our organizational settings. And so on the one hand, I felt we weren't really helping people to act. We were just helping people to think about these issues. Um, on the other hand, I started looking uh, a number of years ago, about a dozen years ago now, on a lot of research that was coming out in fields of psychology and fields of behavioral ethics, behavioral economics, um, even cognitive neurosciences, for example, that was suggesting that when we encounter values conflicts, we don't typically um, approach them as if they're um, a, a pro and con list or an entirely intellectual decision. We tend to react to them emotionally um, and we act um, automatically, even unconsciously. And then we rationalize after the fact why that was the right thing to do or the only thing that we could do successfully. And so by simply giving people um, models of reasoning, we're not really breaking that emotional, unconscious, automatic connection. What we really need to do is to literally rewire that reaction that we have when we encounter these kinds of values conflicts. 
And so from this research that I was looking at, um, uh, research on habit formation, research in the field of positive deviance, which is folks who study individuals who deviate from the norm, but in a positive direction, uh, research in neurosciences about creating new neural pathways and about brain plasticity, I began to realize that maybe what we need to do is to give people the opportunity to practice, to rehearse. This idea came to me actually when I was taking a self-defense class um, and they taught us about um, muscle memory, specific state muscle memory. We would practice all the physical self-defense moves but then a gentleman in a padded suit, sort of like the Michelin man would come in and he would attack us. <laughs> we wouldn't necessarily know when or what hold he was going to use. And then we could use the, the uh, lessons we had learned in, a, in an experience that really replicated the kind of situation that you might have to use it in. The idea is that you're creating a muscle memory. So I was thinking, why couldn't we create a kind of moral muscle memory? Um, and so the idea behind giving voice to values is to present uh, people with situations, with um, um, uh, encounters, um, that, uh, uh, scenarios that are post-decision making, where we then invite people to think, what if you wanted to do the right thing? Not what would you do, not what's the right thing to do, but what if you were this protagonist who knows what he or she thinks is right? How could you get it done? And the idea there is that then um, you, you're given permission to imagine what it would be like to be this person and to create the scenario. You don't have to commit to anything until you've actually um, figured out there are some ways to do this. And so giving voice to values uses numbers of these kinds of post-decision-making scenarios. We base them all on real situations. We share what the actual person did for good or ill. Um, and we try and learn from that experience when they were successful. We try and correct the experience um, and when they were less successful, and we practice scripting and action planning. There's a lot more to it. There's a, a, a lot of steps that we go through, and there's a lot of tools that we've identified, but the core idea behind it is that you get to create this kind of moral muscle memory, this kind of habit, and you begin to identify the kinds of objections, the kinds of reasons and rationalizations you might encounter when you try to do what you believe is right, so that you can practice. How can these be can deconstructed? Because these reasons and rationalizations are powerful, but they're not bulletproof. But it's hard to think of responses in the moment. And it's important to learn from people who've been successful. I think this is hugely important in the field of tech, fields of technology because there's so many wonderful things that we're gonna be able to accomplish and that we are accomplishing through these new developments in engineering and science, sciences and computers, artificial intelligence, et cetera. But there's also a lot of potential challenges, risks, and so what we want to do is enable your capacity to act on them. So I hope this is useful. Um, if you're curious to learn more how this is being used all over the world, literally all seven continents and all kinds of organizations, feel free to be in touch with me. Mary Gentile, University of Virginia, Darden School of Business. Thank you very much for your time today.
Hi, I'm Kara Carter. I'm a research associate at Emrelief, a nonprofit technology company working to transform access to social services. Today, I'm gonna to share with you some insights into designing a better enrollment experience for individuals applying for food assistance through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, commonly known as SNAP or food stamps. Emrelief uses digital marketing to share information about SNAP and refer users to our SNAP eligibility screener. Our screener is available in English and Spanish, on the web, and over text message. Through our screener, we help people find out if they are eligible for SNAP in three minutes or less. In select states, we have also launched our client relationship management platform, Johnny, to connect individuals who screen as likely eligible for SNAP with caseworkers who can guide them through the application process. Emrelief's technology works outside of the existing SNAP enrollment process in each state. In order to achieve our mission of transforming this process, we advocate for changes to make it easier for individuals to access these critical benefits. So what is that current process? While the general steps are the same in all 53 participating states and territories, the user experience varies greatly. In Illinois, residents can apply for SNAP benefits by filling out a paper application and submitting it via fax, mail, or dropping it off at a local Illinois Department of Human Services office. Applicants can also apply online through the Application for Benefits Eligibility Portal, which I will refer to as ABE. The Illinois Paper SNAP application is a combined application. It also includes required questions for applicants seeking cash or medical assistance. All in all, the paper application is 20 pages long, with information related to SNAP appearing on 17 of those pages. The ABE online application allows applicants to specify that they are applying only for SNAP or for SNAP in addition to other programs. To apply solely for SNAP, applicants have to click through 28 pages of application questions and answer a minimum of 48 required fields to submit the application. SNAP applications are incredibly lengthy, but that's only the start. Prior to or after submitting an application, individuals must submit supporting documents to verify their residency and legal status, income, and expenses. If these documents are not submitted with the application, they're likely to be requested prior to benefits being issued. SNAP applicants are also required to complete an interview with an IDHS representative to review their application information. At the time of the interview, applicants will generally be told either that they are denied, that they are required to submit additional documentation for verification, or in the best case, that they are approved for benefits. So as Emrelief thinks about how we can advocate for a better SNAP enrollment experience, we're focused on elevating the voices of SNAP applicants and of outreach workers who assist individuals to apply for SNAP. During the spring and summer of 2021, I conducted a qualitative study in Illinois to investigate whether specific elements of the SNAP application process present barriers to enrollment. I interviewed 19 individuals who provide SNAP enrollment assistance and 13 SNAP applicants themselves about their experiences interacting with the Illinois SNAP application. We learned a ton from these interviews that those learnings both improved our own products and have also informed our advocacy strategy. In the next five minutes, I will highlight just a few examples of how user experience feedback can inform changes that can improve the current Illinois enrollment experience. One thing we heard very clearly in these interviews is that the design of the ABE online application portal is confusing and intimidating. This screenshot is just one example. There's this big block of red text in all caps that contains a warning written in legalese about improper use of this system. Not only is this an intimidating design choice, it's also incredibly difficult to read. ABE also requires account creation in order to submit an application. Now that has many advantages and is pretty common. Unfortunately, ABE currently lacks support features to recover accounts when a user ID is lost or answers to secret questions are forgotten. This results in many duplicate accounts being created and lost application information that makes this portal more difficult for all types of users and results in poor data quality on the administrative side. 
At Emrelief, we advocate for user-friendly and accessible design choices. This screenshot is the page our users see after completing the eligibility screener. We share information to set expectations about this process and help our users make an informed decision about continuing on to apply. Research has consistently shown that web design aesthetics are the most prominent driver of user trust, followed closely by various elements of transparency, accuracy, authority, and utility. Another thing we heard from ABE users is that the way questions are asked on the application is confusing. This example illustrates that even a helpful UX feature like a tooltip, when not properly tested, can fail to provide the information users need to make an informed choice. This person already selected to only apply for SNAP, but this tooltip includes information that indicates different answers depending on the type of assistance needed. Further, the explanation for SNAP is not necessarily accurate. We want to avoid confusing our users. In the context of civic technology, this requires program-specific knowledge to ensure that the help text displayed leads users to the right conclusion. For example, a SNAP assistance unit, or SNAP household, is generally defined as individuals who live together and purchase and prepare meals together. The assistance unit is defined differently for Medicaid, TANF, and other government programs. While combined applications can remove barriers to benefit access, they can also add confusion. Ensuring that applicants see only information that is relevant to them by using question logic and a thoughtful structure can eliminate this confusion without compromising on the benefits of a combined application. Thorough user testing is imperative to ensure users can understand and follow the question flow. The number one issue users elevated about the Illinois enrollment experience is the requirement for identity verification. While anyone can submit an application, the ABE portal requires users to verify their identity prior to accessing their case information. Without access to the Manage My Case portion of the portal, applicants must rely on notices delivered through the U.S. Postal Service. These notices are often delayed and sometimes even go undelivered. These notices are crucial for the completion of the enrollment process. They contain information related to additional documents needed and about the scheduled required interview. Many users fail identity verification because of a lack of credit history or simply due to the complex nature of the questions asked. This is a huge barrier within the SNAP enrollment process. But it doesn't have to be that way. In Florida, applicants are not required to verify their identity to access their case information. Florida also invested in translating their online application into Spanish and Haitian Creole to further enhance accessibility. One of the outreach workers I spoke to had this to say about the importance of design within the ABE system. I think that SNAP is such an important program that it's really important that it is extremely accessible and that it's pretty to look at, quite honestly. It determines the trust they have in the system that they're using to submit the application, and it just makes the process like easier for you as a user when it looks to you like something that is usable and makes sense to you. I hope these examples have inspired you to consider the different ways that user testing and design choices can improve the effectiveness of civic technology and remove barriers to accessing critical social programs. Thank you all for your commitment to public interest technology. Please reach out if you'd like to connect about Emrelief's work, the SNAP program, or civic technology more broadly. Thank you.
right, my name is Matt Hastings. Uh, my talk today is Tech Ethics to Live By. I've always seen ethics as a matter of education, in that we learn our ethics as we interact with people and the world. And as much as popular discourse around ethics today focuses on some of the bigger picture questions, ultimately I see ethics as a matter of self-formation. Ethics, like education, names our efforts the efforts we make to live rightly, with intention, according to some vision we have of who we ought to be. From this perspective, my work has always been driven by two fundamental questions. What does it mean to live well, and how do we help each other live well? I'm currently exploring these questions with students studying science and technology at Colorado School of Mines. And these, questions, these are questions they will engage with uh, implicitly or explicitly throughout their careers and lives, as we all will. Uh, through this course, we hit upon many of the current ethical controversies around technology uh, present in our popular discourse, most recently in the news, for example, the scandals of Theranos and Facebook. Um, however, I see these controversies as largely reflecting uh, the second question. How do we help each other live well? These are questions of social justice through which we work to together to navigate our shared fate. And there's a robust literature engaging with such questions as we grapple to align powerful tools and systems with notions of justice and human goods. We talk about the consequences of technology and society and people. We talk about ethical processes uh, by which we design tools. Uh, there's uh, ethical standards of conduct of what it means to be a professional uh, within uh, the science and engineering and research uh, space. These are all important ethical perspectives to explore. However, I think my first question, the more existential question, what does it mean to live well, is often overlooked in this discourse. Specifically, I think it is overlooked in reference to the lives of those making technology, the scientists, engineers, researchers, as well as, as, well as the marketers, managers, sales teams, and others who contribute to the evolving vision and integration of technologies into our society. How does working with technology, inventing it, fine tuning it, marketing it, contribute to our personal flourishing? This is the question I wanna focus on here, and I hope those listening to this talk, those working in tech fields, will take this as an opportunity to reflect on their relationship to their work and the role their work plays in them living a meaningful and exemplary life. So what does it mean to live well? Another way to ask this question is, what does it mean to flourish? This is the kind of question that keeps philosophers continually employed. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to a settled answer. It's one that each of us continually asks and answers for ourselves over the course of our lives, and one that we engage with again and again through our culture, community, and politics. There are a lot of descriptions of what it takes to live a flourishing life. These guiding characteristics and ideals, such as courage, honesty, humility, carefulness, these virtues help us pay attention and evaluate our beliefs and behaviors. And they also give us language to talk about what it means to live well. Flourishing is also a process. Whatever characteristics you set upon, you have to try to organize yourself, organize your life in order to live them, in order to constitute yourself in accordance with them. Further, you have to integrate competing ideals into a harmonious whole, doing justice to yourself, exercising control, in order to develop and maintain the integrity of your life, integration. We don't simply do this through individual will. We're heteronymous, not autonomous. Who we can become is dependent on our relationships and our environment. Work is one such place of relationships and environment in which we give shape to our lives. Work is a really important one. We spend a third of our lives working, nearly 90,000 hours. It's a deeply formative part of our life. So what makes a job contribute to your flourishing? Work at its best puts you in a productive tension with the world. The world, the environment, other people resists our will and demands not domination, but reconciliation. How do we fit our ideals, personal and shared, within a recalcitrant world? Work names such efforts. When we give shape to our lives, we do not sit idle. We engage, we, we exert effort, respond to feedback, 
We are reconciling our dreams with reality and find, and find meaning and value in this reconciliation. As the world tests our skills and judgment, it teaches us about who we are. For better or worse, these efforts shape our bodies and minds, shape the character of our lives. Sometimes work breaks us, posing too great a challenge, wearing us down. And sometimes it comes too easily, allowing us to go slack. In engaging with this tension, we create environments that help us navigate between wearing down and going slack. These environments, countries, institutions, cities, corporations, and businesses, communities, and homes, are zones of proximal development, stabilizing past achievements, allowing us to build on who we are, uh, who, who we have become through such efforts. So what is good about work is that it puts you in a deep connection with the world, with reality. And this connection is where you give shape to your life, where you explore what it means to live well. So what does technology have to do with all this? And I want to turn to those working with technology and ask, what is particular about working with tech with regards to personal flourishing? There's a, this is a moment where I encourage you to reflect on what drew you to working with digital technology in the first place. There are obvious material and social rewards, high wages, status, power. These all can contribute to your flourishing, but we often see in our culture how the pursuit of these goods can become self-defeating as well, leading to personal crisis of meaning and purpose. Instead, I want to suggest that there's something about the experience of working with technology that is important to your flourishing. Here, it's important to ask, how does your job organize your time, your body, your behaviors, your attention? How does it bring you into tension with the world and allow you to work towards reconciliation? One of the dangers of working with tech is that it often leads to abstraction. It can allow for actions at great distances, separating people from consequences, from direct feedback. While, it, while this allows for the great accumulation of power, it can also diminish the quality of the experience of work. But ideally, technologies draws out from ourselves and into more intimate contact with the world. With technologies, we create environments that give us shape, supporting our efforts and supporting our flourishing. When you develop digital tools, you work to reconciling yourself with others, those using your tools. This is the formative tension you face, the tension that gives shape to your life, and working through this tension contributes to your flourishing. This requires learning and responding to, the, to users' lives, their flourishing, and creating tools to support this good. Through this reconciliation, between developer and user, you too come to flourish. Working through this tension is formative, pushing you to respond and grow to a reality outside of yourself. This might mean organizing your work at an appropriate scale, that in developing digital tools, you might need tighter connection to the communities who use your creations in order to respond to them better. You might need to engage in interdisciplinary work, bringing more of yourself to the table, bringing together different perspectives and skill sets in order to leverage the right resources uh, to solve carefully defined problems. You're likely already doing these kinds of things. And perhaps this is just a moment to reflect on how this kind of work gives shape to your life. But what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to focus on your daily experiences, noticing how they're formative, um, the ethical dimensions of them. In doing so, I hope that you'll pause and take care that these daily experiences are contributing to your own flourishing, that they are worthy of your time and attention, that your work with technology is making you a better version of yourself, and to see how the answer to this question likely draws you in closer and careful connection with the people whose lives your creations impact. So I want to bring us back to the broader tech ethics conversation that's going on today. Those working in tech have an invested interest in this conversation for obvious reasons, but I hope you now see another entry point, that the quality and character of your work is at stake, that this deeply formative part of your life is at stake, that your position as somebody developing new technologies is an essential starting point for thinking about the ethics of technology. Thank you, and I uh, look forward to uh, discussing this paper, among others, uh, when we are together. Hello, my name is Callan Mignoli and I am the director of the library at Owen College of Engineering. 
in Needham, Massachusetts. We are a proud member of the Pitt UN. And the talk I have for you today is called Libraries, Public Ambassadors of Technology. I'll be discussing not only how we are thinking about how public interest technology and libraries intersect at Olin, but also how I think the broader Pitt UN network and public interest technology initiatives writ large to partner with public libraries and libraries of all kinds. So I'm going to start this talk out with doing some analysis of shared values that I feel exist between public libraries and spaces like a better tech and other public interest technology initiatives. Number one here is that libraries provide space for democracy. They aspire to be free to all. Another is that libraries focus on social impact. This takes many different forms, not only in things that are more tangible, like books and story time and programs, but also in things that are a little harder to pin down, like equity, social cohesion, and community placemaking. Libraries also try to co-design their services and offerings with real people. This is an example of a user-centered design process that happened at a public library in South Carolina that was aimed at trying to get as many different voices involved in the planning process for a new space to be renovated as they possibly could get. And lastly here in terms of core values, libraries inspire and enable creativity. And they do this through many different means, but one in particular is in the form of maker spaces and circulating technology. So to clarify what I mean by circulating technology, you see in the background here, the slide, there is a whole host of different objects that are available for circulation from a library. And this at the bottom here, there are vacuum cleaners all the way up to rakes and garden shears. There are sewing machines. There's a little ukulele. There's all kinds of stuff on this wall. And so libraries have begun, as, as some of you may already know, circulating far more than just books, DVDs, and the like. Our college library here at Olin, we circulate all manner of tools. We circulate vinyl cutters, sewing machines, power drills, etc. cetera. Uh, a lot of libraries have everything ranging from all that stuff, plus stuff like telescopes and uh, bird washing kits, so much more. And they also have maker spaces. So in the previous slide, there was a bunch of teenagers who built skateboards using materials and machines that were available to them in the library makerspace. Here at Olin, we have a library that is predominantly a makerspace. There are sewing machines, there are tools and all kinds of space to work on different projects on. There's a screen printer, vinyl cutter, a whole host of camera and video equipment. And this enables a lot of more equitable access to these tools. It also takes some of the pressure off of how people learn. And this is something that I think is becoming all the more important in how libraries provide services. Nowadays, it's not just a matter of having a fancy 3D printer to do novelty gags with that could help you get a job in the future if you know how to use something like that. And I think one of the key ways that public interest technologists and in college, especially STEM engineering students, can partner with public libraries is helping them in starting makerspaces, staffing those makerspaces, or helping them with getting the circulating tech collections up and running. Borrowable experiences are another thing that I think has a lot of potential. And here at uh, Olin, we had an alum who works in a space called Culture House, where they worked with a local public library to make a circulating kit for outdoor gatherings. Um, and that included some heat lamps and some chairs that fold out, a couple other items as well to permit COVID safe gatherings. And they you know, engineered together some beautiful, extremely compact way in which to distribute these things to libraries. So that's another way that technology students can get involved in doing some really creative and unusual things for public libraries. Also citizen science is huge in public libraries. There are a lot of summer reading programs directed at students going through K through 12 that have all kinds of different themes, but a lot of them tend to come around in the form of science. There's also a lot of participatory science projects that have been launched or have happened at public libraries. 
things like trying to count the number of uh, a certain type of bird species in an area, things like that. Um, also, a lot of libraries circulate telescopes, and they have people come to the library to give programs on how to use those, how to do stargazing, how to do bird watching, etc. And this is something that technology students could get a huge amount of fulfillment from sharing their skills or passion for these things with their local library patrons. Another thing to point out here is that in libraries, often inclusion, true inclusion of our communities means getting beyond our four walls and doing some outreach. Here you'll see a couple of bookmobiles that required a lot of different technical engineering and switching around and innovation to be able to get them to do what, all that they need to do now. They're not just books. There's not just books in there. There's internet access, there's computer access, et cetera. A few libraries during COVID converted old school buses into roaming Wi-Fi hotspots to try to get library uh, Wi-Fi access out into the community even when their buildings were closed. Also, the same alum at Olin that I mentioned earlier worked with a, a library here that uh, needed a, an outdoor Wi-Fi porch for people to be able to use while the building was closed, and they did an amazing job on that. Definitely take a, a moment to Google search Somerville Public Library Wi-Fi Porch um, and check that out. Libraries also offer welcoming safe spaces to a wide swath of people in society. Aspirationally, they're open to all kinds of people, all ages, all classes, all races, all genders, all everythings. And um, I think that they provide a really great cross-section of people to work on with public interest technology initiatives. Libraries also spend a lot of time fighting for an equitable digital world. And this is not only in the form of trying to get people to um, be able to access computers and internet, but also to just access information, period. We are coming into a time when so much of information is born digital and put into really non-library friendly licensing schemes that we run the risk of ebooks and streaming media, DVDs that are not going to be physically produced anymore, films and TV shows that may no longer be accessible to people via things like libraries. And we spend a lot of time sort of advocating to make those things more affordable and more accessible to our patrons. This is something that we could benefit from public interest technology help with as well, both in terms of understanding the importance of this, but also coming up with new ways to address things like licensing, to make publishers feel less like they need to price gouge us for everything, um, and also ways to make uh, streaming content more equitably accessible. Also, libraries are champions of their own ethics, and which largely amount to intellectual freedom and the pursuit of whatever you like without surveillance, um, and also patron privacy writ large. We don't like to broadcast what it is that you have checked out or what you're exploring or researching at the library. And in this way, we act as sort of a counterweight to a lot of big tech companies that depend on surveillance as their economic model. And I was commenting to a friend recently that libraries are sort of like an anti-Facebook in that we fight against disinformation, we try to build cohesion and community, and we try to reduce polarization in society. And I think that is a mission that public interest technology folks can relate to and understand and maybe want to participate in. And lastly here, libraries provide social infrastructure this is a term that I nicked from Eric Kleinenberg's book, Palaces for the People. And this is something that I feel like all public interest technology projects are trying to aspire to as well. We want a society that is built on technology and systems that work for as many people as possible. We want them to be participatory and we want them to be fair. And libraries give us a gateway to do that. I think there's so much untapped potential between libraries, both academically within the Pitt UN colleges that they serve, but also for students in Pitt UN student groups and with other like-minded sort of social oriented STEM work to get out there and really make these things come together. There's so much we can do with this and I hope that you will consider thinking about how you might partner with your academic library and or public libraries on your public interest technology endeavors. Be brave and keep reading. And I hope that you have a wonderful time at the Better Tech Conference. Any advice I can give, ideas, et cetera, I'm so happy to talk to you about any of it. Thank you so much for having me. 
and see you later. Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching. My name is Kat Jennings and I'm here representing my firm Countdown Capital, which is a new type of VC firm with a crazy idea for building the future that we want. And that crazy idea is ethical investing. And this new idea is rather perfect to explain during the ideas section of the Better Tech Conference. So thank you so much for having me. To briefly introduce myself, I am an NYU alum. I studied philosophy and mathematics with a bit of physics in the College of Arts and Science. Then I worked in wealth management at Morgan Stanley for a few years, and now I'm currently currently pursuing a master's degree specializing in ethics at Oxford University in the UK, whilst also co-launching and co-running Countdown Capital, uh, which we launched in January. So it's certainly been a busy year. And I like to think this strange hodgepodge of experience makes me a good fit to talk about ethical investing. So as with any venture capital firm, Countdown Capital invests in companies at the pre-seed and seed stages, aka the very, very early stages of development, and we help them get off the ground, hence Countdown Capital. So our focus is in deep tech specifically, which means we invest in and provide in-house support to deep tech startups that are leading us into the new frontiers of space, robotics, AR, VR, AI, ML, a lot of acronyms there, et cetera. But we, there are other deep tech focused VC firms. So what makes us unique? Well, what we think makes us unique is that we have also a huge focus on spreading awareness of the importance of ethics in these early and future stages of a company's development. Now, you might be thinking, ethical deep tech. What even is that? Is that even possible? Who's going to want to invest in that? Is that even lucrative? Well, I am pleased to report that yes, it is. This past year alone, we have raised 5.5 million in assets under management so far, with a combined portfolio worth over 100 million today in enterprise value. And we've also co-invested alongside some of the biggest venture capital firms in the world, including Founders Fund, Lux Capital, just to name a couple. So it turns out deep tech can make the world a better place, and it's not just a nice idea. And the reason I say all of this is to illustrate that ethical investing is lucrative and is also really, really important for the future. And that's really our lesson and our message to everybody. So where did the origins of deep tech begin? Excuse me, there we go. So they began in the early 1990s to mid 2000s where accessible websites and email ushered in a digital era. So think eBay, AOL, Yahoo. Then the second frontier began and this led us to the advent of apps and social media and 24 hour connectivity. Think Facebook, Instagram, Slack, Uber, even Tinder if you like that sort of thing. So what's next? Countdown wants to get ahead of what's coming. And this third frontier began in the late 2010s and will continue to the late 2030s. And during this time, the apps and intelligences that we created will begin to converge with the physical world around us, which is extremely exciting. So think AI that can drive your car, VR that can place you in an alternate universe in your mind, intelligent drones that can deliver your packages within hours of you ordering them. So in fact, we also have four companies already achieving the future in some of these ways. So think, you know, trucks refitted with computer vision technology, digital information visually embedded in the real world. And my personal favorite, Dash Systems on the bottom right corner there, they are inventing packages equipped with autonomous delivery tail kits, which means that we can access rural areas that either cannot get mail already or can get mail with huge, huge delays. So this is going to make mail and access a lot more accessible and cheaper. And we're really excited about that. And there is an environmental benefit to doing it this way as well. So seems exciting, right? What could possibly go wrong with all this? Well, it turns out a lot can go wrong when it comes to the future of deep tech. So with tremendous strides in tech, such as artificial intelligence, et cetera, come new issues that we have never had to grapple with before. And before you think these are just predictions or a bit dramatic, you know, 20 million jobs replaced by machines and robots by 2030, 25% of, of US jobs at high risk of automation, 1000% more likely that people of color will be wrongly classified by facial recognition algorithms. You might think this is too far-fetched. This isn't true. You're just trying to scare us. Nope. Companies are already facing these concerns. This is absolutely happening. And if a company hits one of these issues head on, like what happened with Uber, unfortunately, one of their self-driving cars hit and killed a woman, absolutely awful. Instead of anticipating and handling that issue in advance and coming up with a plan, there can be serious ethical and financial implications for that company. So these companies survive, right? Facebook has already spent 
five billion dollars in data privacy and governance fines and carrier iq has failed already and this illustrates perfectly the difference between companies like that while facebook can afford to run into these issues head on and without thinking at the head of them in advance because they can afford five billion dollars companies like carrier iq cannot and they ran into these issues without thinking about them in advance and they were unfortunately decimated after that so in contrast as you'll see on the screen as well some companies are already coming out on top ahead of their competitors by overcoming these issues before they even arise. So by including ethics in our investment portfolio, that is what we aim to help our companies do alongside providing them with financial and in-house support, of course. This is what makes Countdown Capital unique in the VC and tech space. So unlike most VC fund managers, we aim to bring that sense of social responsibility to the companies we interact with. And by doing so, we ensure that startups are as informed and responsible as possible about the broader ethical implications of their choices and their trajectory. So how do we do this? It's a lot of talk so far. Well, don't worry, we put it into practice as well. We've created an independent steering committee to support startups with a sounding board. Our steering committee helps them think about and get educated on a variety of issues in deep tech and applied ethics. So think the ethics of space exploration, algorithmic bias, trolley problems, the black box problem in AI, labor displacement. Our team helps us think about those issues in advance, spot them with our companies, and then fix them before they begin. And this six member committee is comprised by some of the world's greatest minds in ethics, including the director of the NYU bioethics department, Matthew Liao, the stern director of business ethics, Matt Statler, who is also co-organizing this event, and the former undersecretary of state in the Obama administration and current VP of InQtel, Sarah Seawall. So we are very, very lucky to have these folks with us and they work together with us and our company founders to provide that value add for startup leaders as they navigate the ethical and policy issues related to tech business and the next frontier. So by utilizing this incredible committee of thinkers and our team who are of course committed to ethically minded investing and investors, we are able to look for and invest in companies that we believe have the goal of bettering the world somehow in mind. And then we get to provide them with ethics as a service. So what does ethics as a service look like? These are just some of the ways that we help. So we challenge them to determine and codify their missions, their values, to see where their line is and then prevent them from crossing that line. We engage Engage with stakeholder relationships, which means that we can leverage all of our amazing connections to think tanks that we have and professors and academics in the ethics field and also financial fields. We conduct ethical risk assessments by conducting our due diligence. And we also provide data and machine ethics research, which can be really, really important as well, especially when it comes to AI and data storage. And we also have a huge focus on diversity inclusion. And we want to add founders to our portfolio with equitable hiring in mind. And that's really, really important to us. So whether it's a, a VTOL aircraft that runs on sustainable aviation fuel, one of ours, a company using AI to make everyday practices safer, also one of ours, or an efficient hyperjet company founded and run by a female engineer that could transport you from LA to Tokyo in just one hour in a cost and climate effective manner. Also one of ours, Venus Aerospace, shout out there. Countdown is committed to the building of the field and the community of public interest technology. And we think you should be too. So in summary, ethical investing is the future. That is our idea. Thank you very much for your time.
Between 1996 and 2006, Amazon, Facebook, and Google raised about $80 million worth of capital from a handful of venture capital funds all around Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley, California. These three companies alone are now worth $4 trillion, which is about half of US tech stocks, which in themselves are more valuable together than all of European capital markets combined. These venture capital funds from Kleiner Perkins to Sequoia to Excel and Greylock are still in power in Silicon Valley. I want to tell you a little bit today about why I think that in order to make tech better tomorrow, we need to take into consideration today and ideally influence how it is financed by exactly these venture capital investors. We need more scrutinies on VC. For the last four years, since 2017, I've spent countless hours and days in different fieldwork settings with venture capital investors and interviewed about 250 partners, GPs, general partners, or so decision makers in funds in about 500 plus interviews, somewhere between Silicon Valley, where I spent six months, New York, London, and Berlin. What I've been focusing on is what I call the ethics of venture capital, which really going back to an Aristotelian understanding of what that is, meant looking at what is a good startup for a venture capital investor from the perspective of financing the next generation of technologies. I want to share three observations today, which give you a small window into the kinds of things that I've been seeing and end with a call for action to scrutinize what's been happening and what continues to happen in this space that is totally under-researched and under-observed. One, what do these VCs do? The answer in two words is they finance blitz-scaling unicorns. You all have heard about what unicorns are, tech companies, companies that are valued at higher than one billion US dollars. Blitzscaling is a term that's coined by a venture capital investors and LinkedIn founder and original PayPal Mafia member, Reid Hoffman, in a book that was published in 2019, which ultimately you can shorten into scaling just very fast. VCs usually fund business models that are very light, not too many assets, not very capital intensive, and that are fast to scale to a point where they can be exited. Because in the end, the venture capital investor is an asset manager who manages the asset owners, which are endowments, pension funds, state funds, family offices. In other words, a lot of all of our money um, that we would have put into our pension or that in the case of the EU is ma managed taxpayers' money. Um, they are managing these so-called limited partners' money and need to pay them back within somewhere between four and 10 years. They hence have an incentive for the companies, the tech companies that these um, VCs support and finance to come to a point where they are big enough to be sold slash go public um, in a so-called initial public offering in the stock markets within that time span. In a time where capital is very cheap, we've been seeing an environment of very low interest rates for the last decade. Um, there's massive competition to get into the best deals, i.e. to be able to finance what is supposed to be the next generation of big tech, i.e. very little scrutinies on which companies get financed if they fit a certain trend, which to a certain extent means it matters less what problems are solved by the companies as long as there is a big market. The recent surge in money in what is called immediate delivery apps, so the door dashes of this world, just everything in 10 minutes, is a good example of that. Second, how do VCs finance these startups, the next generation of Googles and Amazons of this world? A venture capital investor put it very interestingly um, and poignantly recently on Twitter. He called it Vibe Capital. VCs vibe with founders and that's how in a very extreme case, um, money is distributed. There's very little quantitative data on very young, new startups, um, meaning the venture capital investor deciding about where to put their money, they often refer back to gut feelings, to excitements, to what are other people doing. The fear of missing out is a very big problem in the venture capital industry, creating trends and reproducing trends. So in a sense, the investment style of a venture capital investor 
is heuristic rather than quantitative, quote unquote, data driven. What that means is in the end, a big portion of the investment decision making is driven by networks. VCs tend to invest in friends or friends of friends or alumni that went to the same school. That matters in and of itself, but it also matters insofar as it leads to a reproduction of a, what historically was and still is a white male elite educated industry that reproduces itself not only in and of itself as a VC industry, but also in terms of the startups that get funding. Just to give you two examples here, only 10% of um, GPs, so general partners decision making um, personnel in VCs are women worldwide. And between 2015, to look at the side of the startups that get funding from these uh, VCs, only 2.4% of all the money invested in the US went to black and Latinx um, founders versus about 17% of um, the population that they make up in the US. So here's a massive um, reproduction of an unequal, powerful elite, both in and of itself and into the companies that get a chance to grow and become big tech. Now, I don't want to end um, with a miserable outlook to say that this is all going to continue going forward. There's a certain a moment that has partly at least been driven by COVID leading to what you could call a changing ethics, referring back to my original conceptualization of this. Pushed for both by the Me Too movement as well as Black Lives Matter, particularly in the US, there's um, a concern to increase diversity and inclusion both in the VC industry and in the underlying startups that get funding. This is not let to an immense amount of statistically measurable change. In fact, the funding for female founders in 2020 went back, which definitely had to do with many people dropping out of work completely, many women dropping out of work completely due to care requirements that often fell onto them during COVID. But at least a lot of awareness has been generated, which hopefully we're going to see to lead to more change over the coming years. Second, there's more concern with impact. Um, Sir Ronald Cohen published a book last year that was called Impact. And in that, he as a father of British venture capital and private equity declared and proposed within the next years, we're going to see about 10% of capital being allocated in impact funds and impactful investment strategies. This would mean that um, people are starting to think through what it is that these businesses that they're funding do. This has started to happen in venture capital where certain funds explicitly position themselves in this category. Lastly, a kind of um, neighboring point, ESG environmental social governance principles are starting to take, um, are starting to be taken up by venture capital investors as they are making the rounds, both in public equities and other private markets, such as the buyout market. Um, that would also come with increased scrutiny on what is being done in these funds, but a big caveat here, what we've been seeing in the public markets has already led, in terms of ESG initiatives, has already been criticized and led to what some people call white, green or impact or ESG washing. This has to be avoided, obviously, in order to actually drive real change. And it is yet to be seen whether that is possible. All of that to say, just sharing three observations from um, both the fieldwork and the interviews I've been doing in my general view on venture capital, i.e. investors into technology companies that will become the next Amazon and Facebook and Googles of this world. We need more attention, we need more research, we need more scrutiny, we need a better understanding. It isn't really, um, it shouldn't really be the case that I'm one of the only anthropologists, sociologists out there who studies these people um, in order to be able to put pressure onto them, in order to be able to show what is going wrong and possibly right in that industry. Ultimately, because this can be seen as a preventative strategy, the decisions that these people who sit on boards of these companies for a decade and beyond take today impact us in 10 years. The ethics of AI, on the other hand, are trying to clean up what has been allowed to happen, what in some cases has been pushed to happen, at least has been monitored by these venture capital investors 10 years ago. So to all of you out there, let's help put more scrutinies on the finance of tech in order to make tech better.
and I'm the founder and executive director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, a New York-based privacy and civil rights organization that's fighting against the growth of surveillance at the state and local level. And I'm also a fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project and NYU Law School's Information Law Institute. I want to talk a bit about the ways that technology is impacting our communities, ways that we might not intend but are every bit as real, and look at the ethical responsibility that all of us who are working in technical fields have to account for those harms that our tools propagate, to look at the impact they're having on the most vulnerable communities around us, and to really hold ourselves ethically accountable for the work we do and the way that it reverberates in the world around us. You know, at STOP, we focus a lot on police technology, the way that novel tools are augmenting age-old biases, the ways that, you know, law enforcement officers can use systems like social media monitoring, uh, facial recognition, artificial intelligence-based tools for predictive policing, all to try and automate and systematize the policing process. But oftentimes, those systems aren't what they claim to be. Oftentimes, when you look beneath the algorithmic hood, what you see are crude mathematical constructs based and biased, built on a framework of inequity, taking years, decades of biased human activity and transforming it into something bright and shiny and highly profitable, but at the end of the day, not remotely just. Now, police surveillance has gotten a lot of attention in, in recent months with the rise of facial recognition, but I, I want to look more broadly at the way this technology is impacting our communities, our city. It's transformed what was once a, a space that nurtured individuality and autonomy into corridors of control, places where our every movement is tracked. You know, in the New York City of my childhood, you know, we had a level of freedom, a level of anonymity, a level, to, uh, an ability to choose our own destiny that goes beyond anything possible today. Because when we walk around the city, we know that everything is being recorded, that everything is potentially being judged, that our entire life can be rewound by these surveillance systems that track months, years of activity, and then reinterpret it, reframe it judge it. Now, when we look at public places like our parks, our libraries, these used to be the social fabric of our, of our communities that were truly open to all. You know, having these third spaces as places we could congregate, that we could meet people outside of our own social bubble, that was something that really brought us together as a singular city instead of, you know, several disparate communities were working and living in parallel. Of course, we've, we've always had segregation in this city. Of course, we've always had lines of division. But a few decades ago, we saw more. We saw more interconnectivity. We saw more interaction. We saw more people, more New Yorkers coming together and truly being part of a shared community every single day. And the technology that tracks so much of our activity also creates barriers. It creates barriers to those who are systematically over-policed. It creates barriers for BIPOC communities, for individuals with criminal justice and involvement. And it creates barriers for undocumented neighbors. You know, these barriers are things we may not see. We may step across these dividing lines without thinking about it. But the technology that is developed by all too often well-meaning individuals is enforcing these systems of exclusion. Look at the you know, daily routine of an undocumented New Yorker who every time they enter a large building, a large institution, they're asked for ID, they're asked for proof of who they are. And each time they do that, they create a record, a record that can then be taken, tracked, and used by immigration and customs enforcement to target them for deportation. This isn't an abstract concern. This is the reality of immigration enforcement in 2021. This is the way that we see data being weaponized by not just ICE, but by the tech vendors that it, uh, it uh, purchases the data from. Groups like Palantir and Thomson Reuters, which create data aggregation products to turn us and our entire life story into a surveillance product for the highest bidder. 
these technologies are not neutral. As Ruha Benjamin and so many others have written, technology replicates the power dynamics and the inequities of the society in which it is used. The technology, no matter how noble, when used in a deeply racist society, will perpetuate those sorts of injustices unless there are checks, unless there are limitations. All of this, this uh, of these parades of horribles, all of these harms, it's easy to dismiss. You know, it's not, it's not always clear what the link is between the one module you're working on, the one piece of code, the one little uh, uh, um, software app, and these broader systems. But that's why there's an affirmative obligation for each of us when we're building technical systems not just to you know, refuse to do active harm, but to investigate the downstream effects of what we build. It's not enough to simply quit a project when you learn that it's going to be sold you know, to the NYPD or ICE. It's not enough to simply refuse to build systems that intentionally discriminate. You have to look at the broader context. You have to look at all of the ways that this technology will en will enable secondary effects, good and bad. And, and so that means that when we're thinking of creating better tech, when we think about creating an ecosystem of innovation that is actually driven by the needs of the public and, and a desire for social justice, it, it means and actively interrogating every single thing we work on. So here are some questions you can think of as you're going through the design and implementation process for a new project. Questions like, who are the possible purchasers of this technology? How might this technology be combined with others? What, are, what do I know about my company's strategies for monetizing this product? What are the ways that this technology could you know, uh, be uh, combined with others in the field. There are a lot of hypothetical questions that may seem completely abstract, but by looking at what you know about the product you're working on, the way it's going to be deployed, and the way that people are going to make money off of it, you can really start to center your work in an ethical conversation about whether this is technology that should be made whether this is technology that you feel comfortable making. I work with a lot of people in technology spaces, people who innovated and created amazing new products and who went on to see those tools, their, their brain children, turned into something far different. They saw the, the code that they created used as weapon systems. They saw the technology that they invented used as a new policing tool, not because it was good at doing any of these tasks, but because it was profitable. And so you can't simply wash your hands of the responsibility for how your technologies are used by the fact that you may be early in your career, that you may have other people above you who are making those decisions. And I'm not the one who is making that moral judgment. I'm not the one who's saying you can't distance yourself. That's what you're likely to tell yourself in the future. Because I can assure you there are so many people in technical spaces around you who spent years building these systems, who saw them being misused and weaponized, and who now are filled with regret for what they've done and what they've enabled. You have the chance to do it differently. You have the chance to learn from their mistakes. You have the chance to try to build a career centered on uses of technology that actually do make the world better instead of just supporting brand slogans that claim to. But it's not easy. It's going to require a lot of due diligence. It's going to require a lot of probing questions. And it's going to require actually saying no when someone offers you a job that sounds great, which has all the perks, but where you can't be certain that it'll actually help build better tech. Thank you so much.
future of work is now. Unfortunately, not everybody's ready for it. Technology's role in making reskilling accessible and equitable for all workers, it's what we're talking about today. Today, we got 160 million US workers, and the overwhelming majority of these workers are deskless, frontline, service sector workers, and they're having a rough time. How does that part go again? Those that get paid the least always uh, pay the most. One in two jobs today are bad jobs. Workers have been paying for more and more than just in their paycheck. Over the last 25 years, investment in training in the US has just kept going down. Today, it's 0.1% of GDP. It's said by Accenture, I think they know some stuff. As many as 80% of the US workforce are doing jobs with no recent instruction in the last five years. That underinvestment, it couldn't come at a worse time. Pre-pandemic, US employee turnover was already bad. 26.3% of annual US turnover. It's the highest of any industrialized country. It's been increasing year over year. And nearly half of that turnover happens in employees' first 90 days. Why does it happen? It's the way we designed it. And that's also why we can change it. You can't just talk about the workforce without talking about workers. Gallup had a research study that came out a few years ago. It said that 15% of the global workforce wakes up every day and is, quote, excited about going to work. That was before the pandemic. That's bad. It's been getting worse since remote work. The labor impact, and now the attack on workers from everyday consumers, politicians, business leaders. We've gone from calling workers great to calling them lazy. We can't turn on the TV today without being bombarded with messaging around this thing called the great resignation, where it's believed that one in two workers are gonna leave their jobs before the end of 2021. How has this happened? Bad decisions, bad strategy, bad investment, and bad technology. 91% of the way we skill workers up is stuck in yesterday. Modules, manuals, videos. That's the way we've been doing it in 2021. And we're not even sure what works today. 87% of what you learn on these platforms is thought to be forgotten in as little as 30 days. It can be said that 50% of our workforce is completely forgotten and unserved by today's tools. Harvard Business Review, they also know some stuff, also found that only 1% of workforce training and education is available mobile first. Did you hear that? Only 1% of training is available on something every worker has. It's crazy. And the future of work is now. I told you about the state of our workforce, low wage work dominating. Talked about outdated tools and strategies. That's the infrastructure that's crumbling that we have. We need to change. We need to invest in infrastructure that will help our workers today and our children tomorrow in preparation for a long work life. Another recent study came out that believes the first human that's going to live to 150 years old is in a crib somewhere. 150 years. That's a 110 to 120 year work life. That's not boomers who grew up at a time and lived a life where they carried four to five jobs in their career. That's someone carrying 25 to 30 plus jobs in their lifetime. Do we have the infrastructure to support that? We can act now to build a more diverse, a more equitable, a more competitive, and a more inclusive future of work. But we must act now. Every worker deserves access to quality job training, support, mentorship, education, so they can win on the job and fairly compete in the workforce of tomorrow. And it's time that we give all workers what they need most, a raise. Raising up all workers is not just about a paycheck or a job. It's about providing a fair shot for every worker so we can build a more inclusive, competitive, and equitable workforce. And we can do it by leaning into technology, not by being afraid of it. Step one, we should reskill workers in COVID-19 impacted jobs and industries, including individuals who have lost their jobs, work in a changed environment, and those who are starting new jobs. The World Economic Forum's latest future of work report found that half of all employees around the world will need reskilling by 2025, and that doesn't include the people who are currently unemployed. Yet despite that reality, as we mentioned earlier, only 0.1% of GDP are, are invested on programs that help people adjust to workplace changes. Federal investments in skilled training has decreased by nearly 40% over the last two decades. That decreased investment in our workforce has occurred at a time when the global skills gap continues to widen, and we face an unprecedented need 
to reskill and upskill every worker in every industry. Simply put, we've got too many 20th century solutions for 21st century problems. Number two, we need to align companies, education providers, public workforce divisions like here in Newark, community organizations, tech companies, to form a network of 21st century industry partnerships. A recent finding from WEF's Future of Job Report found that if we create greater public-private collaboration on a large scale, upskilling and reskilling initiatives could boost global GDP by 6.5 trillion, that's 5 million plus jobs by 2030. These types of partnerships would also help transform colleges and universities from time sinks into skill factories by giving students and staff a clear idea of what skills industry leaders are looking for in graduates. Number three, big tech move. We can invest in a future of work infrastructure that leverages technology to reach workers regardless of tenure or job type with a specific focus on our most vulnerable. Do you know that 50% of today's work activities can be automated by 2055? And almost half of American jobs are at high risk of being taken over or heavily impacted by automation. Another 19% face a medium level of risk. Yet, only 40% of HR leaders are redesigning jobs to prepare for the future of work. 83 cents of every dollar goes to the top of an org and just like some other things called trickle down, it doesn't quite get to the people that need it most. This is where technology can help. The vast majority of workers today who need upskilling and retraining aren't getting it. In the small amount of time and resources that most companies devote to these efforts, they go to the top level executives who need it least or to compliance training and not skill development. If we want to create a more equitable, diverse, thriving future of work where every worker is supported and has the ability to level up, then the federal government needs to play a part in investing in a mobile first future of work infrastructure that can be used to reach all workers and companies also should be thinking this way. Number four, we're moving right through it. Let us support a worker's freedom to learn and upskill anytime, anywhere. Current labor rules were written in yesterday, before the internet was created, and they're holding workers back. Workers that want to succeed in today's workforce know upskilling, learning, and reskilling are lifelong endeavors. Today, the half-life of skills is only five years. That means that many of the new skills a worker has now is going to be worthless by the time they start their next job or move to a new industry. Our businesses, our federal, state, and local governments can step in to invest in a digital credentialing ecosystem that recognizes work experience, it recognizes non-traditional learning programs, and creates a world where things are portable to the employees so they can take them throughout their career. And finally, E, we can eliminate discrimination that restricts a worker's ability to fairly compete, acquire new skills, and access training opportunities. There are many different kinds of discrimination that restrict workers, including discrimination that's based on race, gender, age. But other kinds of discrimination are less obvious, like knowledge discrimination, discrimination based on past court involvement, discrimination caused by the digital divide and racist algorithms, as well as poor tech design practices. Rising inequality also makes it harder to spot future talent, and it stunts workplace growth and innovation. There are policy solutions that can help end this type of discrimination. First, policymakers can work to remove barriers that prevent workers from accessing school or training activities. It includes childcare, uh, housing, medical care. For example, many workers, they don't leave their dead end jobs because they don't want to lose their health insurance. And that prevents employees from investing in their own learning and pursuing better jobs. Another way to decrease hiring discrimination is to ban the box on the job applications that ask candidates about their passport vault. Today in America, more than 65 million people need not even apply for jobs from all types of companies because of the criminal record. Preventing workers from even applying for jobs is discriminatory practice. It stunts business growth. And it discourages people from working to improve themselves and invest in their careers and development. Our workforce deserves a raise. And technology can play a major part here. The future of work is now. And although we're not ready for it, we can take action. Technology's role in making reskilling accessible and equitable for everybody is possible. We have the people, we have the know-how, we have the tools. We just gotta have it. Now, it's 
great to be here with you all at A Better Tech. My name is Malcolm Glenn, and I'm an organizational consultant who spent my career building partnerships between corporations, nonprofits, and governments, and trying to tell the stories of the impact of that work. Right now, I'm trying to accomplish these goals through a couple of different pathways. I'm working to make housing more accessible through work as a fellow at New America's Future of Land and Housing program and as the Director of Public Affairs at Better, a digital platform that makes home ownership more accessible. I'm also a senior fellow at the Center for Workforce Inclusion, a workforce development organization committed to helping older, low-income Americans get access to high-quality jobs. And since the beginning of the year, I've been fortunate enough to serve as an advisor to the Health Action Alliance, leading workshops to help spur COVID-19 vaccine uptake among underrepresented communities in the business and the tech world. And most of my career has been spent in what folks here might call big tech. I spent four and a half years on the policy team at Uber and almost three years leading communications projects at Google. And that experience working at tech companies has helped me see a real challenge when it comes to how tech companies approach diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Because as important as it is for DEI work, to make employees feel welcome, real DEI work doesn't stop at the proverbial water's edge. That is, DEI is insufficient if it only looks at internal structures. The most robust DEI work takes into account output, how DEI is integrated into a company's products and services. This concept, inclusive design, should be the North Star for all DEI work. But it's often an afterthought, if a thought at all. Now, when it is a thought, the work goes beyond simply bringing underrepresented people into a system that continues to set them up to fail. But instead, there's a focus on what practically is going to create the best results and experiences for both employees and customers in the communities served by an institution. So I've spent much of the last many years encouraging companies, both internally and externally, to think about DEI as a two-fold proposition. That is, DEI must look at both internal processes, structures, and programs, but it also must take into account output. This is inclusive design. So how do you practically do this? Well. You do this by positioning yourself as an internal advocate for the work that you care about and finding a clarity of the business case to move your executives to care when they otherwise might not. This means moving your internal stakeholders, not because it's the right thing to do, but because you can sell teams on how to make a business impact that's aligned with the company's long-term goals. Now, doing this effectively doesn't mean treating everyone the same. In fact, it means going out of your way to recognize the differences in the ways that people may engage with your products and services, seeking out feedback from the people in the real world, and making sure that that feedback is reflected in how you're integrating an inclusive design into any consideration of DEI work. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's a one-size-fits-one approach. So you may be asking, that all sounds great, but who's responsible for doing this work? Well, I think the easy answer is all of us. But the more complicated one is that we must recognize that the burden can't fall on the very people who are already marginalized in the tech ecosystem it cannot be entirely our burden to bear. And so in order to shift some of that responsibility onto people in the majority, to the people who disproportionately hold power in these tech spaces, it's key to acknowledge the history of discrimination, not just in technology, but in virtually every single American system. Efforts to intentionally discriminate based on race, gender identity, ability, geography, and so much more are not new. And so if you work at, say, a digital mortgage company, hypothetically, it's not enough to say, we're not going to be biased towards our customers. 
because bias and discrimination have been baked into the history of housing in this country for more than 400 years. You know, when I think back to my time at, say, Uber, we weren't looking to exacerbate issues of transportation and equity. But Ubers did tend to be more expensive further away from public transportation in cities. And I don't have to ask you to guess who was most likely to live in those areas far away from public transit. Listen, it goes far beyond technology companies that have a foothold in the real world. If you work at an ad tech company, look at the egregious history of racism in advertising, both in the ads themselves, as well as across the people making those ads. If you're in ed tech, learn about how discrimination in education did not end after Brown versus Board of Education. You know, there's this great saying, nothing about us without us, which comes from disability advocates across the disability community. And I think it's really a valuable to apply to how tech companies can approach integrating principles of inclusive design into their work. And, you know, I think back to a moment last year, and it seemed for a time like this philosophy of inclusion, nothing about us without us, was going to be intimately integrated into the culture of tons of different tech companies. But what we ended up seeing was a lot of what felt like performative inclusivity, which really worried me. And it's not just in tech, if I'm being honest. And I think you really saw the peak of these performative efforts in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. Because while there was strong rhetoric in the summer of 2020, when you fast forwarded to a year later, the reality of what tech companies had actually done wasn't particularly great. And I think the truth is we shouldn't have expected anything more because Businesses writ large aren't going to be the ones to hold themselves accountable. But I do think employees within those companies can. It's the employees who push leadership to be better. It's the advocates externally who put pressure on companies to make sure that their actions are matching their words. Because the truth is, most tech companies most institutions of all stripes are inherently risk averse. And so they don't want to do things too differently than they've done them before, particularly if they've been very successful in the way that they've done them before. And so in my mind, it's only when the risk of inaction becomes greater than action itself that we can have real accountability for making sure that values aren't just lip service and that inclusive design really does become an integral part of what these tech companies do. Again, this is not the ideal way to make change. But let's be honest, so much of the work that you and I do every day, particularly as an underrepresented person in the tech ecosystem, is less than ideal. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity but it's going to require that internal advocacy. And I hope that you all will take an opportunity to consider how you can be internal advocates in the tech spaces that you occupy. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you for tuning in and for everything that you all are doing to make tech work better. There's a lot more work to do, but we wouldn't have made the progress we've made thus far if it wasn't for all of your contributions. So thank you. Listen, you can always reach out to me if you wanna talk more, learn more about my work, or just chat about how we can make tech better than how we left it. My website is www.malcolmglenn.com. That's M-A-L-C-O-M-G-L-E-N-N. -N. Again, www.malcolmglenn.com. And with that, again, I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that you do. Hi, 
Uh, my name is Devin. We're going to talk about normalizing New York City's open data uh, through the lens of the WeGov NYC project. Uh, so I'm a software producer who organizes teams to deliver software solutions for startups, nonprofits, and government agencies. I was born and raised in New York City, and I want New York City to be the world's best run city. Um, New York City is constantly ranked the world's favorite city. It's the richest city in the country. We have the resources to be the best, and we aren't. Um, and what that means is that we pay more money and get less services than people in other places. And that it affects our health care, it affects our education, it affects our infrastructure. Um, and I think, honestly, it affects uh, the morale of people all around the world um, because, you know, we represent uh, the global city to people all over the world. Um, we're the diverse melting pot where people, where immigrants can come, where people can come um, from all walks of life, find opportunity um, and improve their lot. And uh, if we're not running a, a good city, it makes cities look bad in general. And we need cities to be looking really good because living in cities is uh, much better for the climate. <laughs> you know, people in cities pollute less uh, than people outside of them. So we can, we're not just making New York City better for us, we're making the city better for everybody. How do we make it better? Fortunately, over the last decade, um, people have figured out how to make government work better using technology um, digital service organizations, which were pioneered by the government digital service in the UK. And now we have a bunch in the federal government, in the US, including 18F, which is probably the premier one. Um, they use modern open source software, open data concepts, um, and like startup development practices to deliver services faster, better, and cheaper, and to do digital transformation in a way that uh, empowers people and does not give all of our, does not just outsource all of our technical challenges to third party companies that do all types of stuff that maybe we don't want them to do. Um, so New York City needs a digital service organization, might need a few of them. Um, we've got some groups within the city, primarily the mayor's office of data analytics, also New York City's planning lab that do this type of work, but we need a general purpose digital service organization in the city that can make this stuff happen. Um, so what do we do? You know, WeGov NYC is a volunteer run nonprofit project trying to bring these practices to the city to make New York City the best run in the world. We're open for volunteering. We're open. Uh, we're volunteer led, but we also pay for services. Um, so we'll get to that part of this presentation at the end, hopefully. But right now we're building open source software and data projects. Then we're going to, you know, and we're going to talk about that in particular a normalization project. Um, but we're also after this, you know, going to spend more effort building community, offering news and knowledge to folks and doing public awareness campaigns around best practices using open source and open data for the city. Um, so over the three years of our existence, uh, we've built almost a dozen experimental apps, um, and learned the hard way that, uh, the key to sustainability is data transformation. It's having a steady stream of data, of up-to-date data that's normalized and ready to go and be used by apps and to have that be its own project. Um, without that, everything is too hard to maintain. Um, so we've built data pipelines and that's what we're gonna talk about with New York City uh, with the data book. So the problem that we're trying to solve here is that New York City's open data isn't normalized. We've got over 3000 data sets uh, that are being published in an automated fashion by the city of city from city agencies great work by moda making that happen um unfortunately the data is not standardized really in any way so if you the you can see on the right here um that uh, the way the word agency like as a column header there's many different ways agency as a column header is published in new york city open data same thing true with council districts and and everything um, there is no normalization taking place. So we need to build a normalization layer that um, not only normalizes column headers, things like agency versus agency name, but also the contents of those columns. So we want, um, when NYPD shows up in a data set, we want to say, okay, NYPD is New York Police Department, is the New York Police Department, et cetera, no matter what data set it is. Um, and so that, and that's what, and if we can do that, we can apply a UID 
for NYPD throughout many, many different data sets, then it's easy for us to build apps that show all types of information um, that's being published about that agency uh, you know, in one place. Um, same thing's true with districts, same thing's true with capital project ID codes, that which aren't necessarily UIDs in the traditional sense. Same is true with everything. Um, so what have we done? We, we're trying to normalize this data. So we established an index of like what we consider, I guess, official uh, agency names, official district codes, things like that. Then we build a data pipeline that applies those UIDs to these data sets, and we publish that normalized data in uh, via API so that the public can use it. Um, so when we were building this data transformation pipeline, key features that we needed were uh, we needed to update automatically so that we could sched, you know, new data comes into the, gets published on the portal, we're normalizing it. Uh, and so it's published into our apps without us doing any work. Um, we need that normalization process to be quick. So matching agency, you matching the UIDs in a uh, data set to our core uh, UIDs, our, stand, our normalized UIDs, has to be quick and easy. Um, we need, and then once that data set is transformed, we need to put it into an API so it's easily accessible uh, to our apps and that those apps are uh, quickly editable and updatable so that we can get, we can add new data quickly. And if data changes, if new fields are added, we can make that, uh, we can surface that in the apps. And so we've done this, uh, we've built a pipeline that does this. We start with an Airtable data re repository that basically tracks relevant open data sets that are being published by the city. Um, we normalize that data using a custom built transformer tool um, that leverages Google Sheets as a indexing transformation mechanism. Um, as like our matcher matching interface, basically. Then we republish it in an S3 bucket. The link, the link to that transform data sits in that Airtable. Um, and then we also push that data into a Cardo, open source Cardo instance and make it available via Cardo's SQL API. And it's that API that we use in our data book in our application. Um, so here's an example of how this can, what this means, uh, what we can produce with this. Um, here's agency profiles. So this is an app within the data book, um, data book .wegov NYC that says, that showed, you know, you can select the city agency. In fact, you can select more than that. There are many, um, there are many organizations that are normalized, but city agencies are the ones that we focus on. Um, and with, you can click on an agency like the administration for children's services, and you can see, uh, Every time they, that agency publishes anything in the uh, city record online, that's the notices section. Um, we've got like profile information about that agency, social media, whatever. And then we've got all the data sets that have been normalized. And you can see here, the amount of records normalized related to that agency is, is substantial. Um, you know, we have the green book, which is a people directory. We have their services. We have capital project data, indicators, finances, jobs, facilities. 20 plus data sets are normalized. You can see them all uh, on the agency profile. Um, we also have capital projects. So by combining three official city data sets along with some volunteer and automated data co collection around geography, um, we were able to produce what's certainly the best, maybe the only publicly available geolocated directory of the city's 2,500 plus capital projects. Um, when we did this, we discovered that uh, our capital budget's over 100% over budget um, 48 billion, $84 billion over budget, um, 20,000 years late. Uh, anyway, you can see these capital projects, um, by agency. Uh, you can see them uh, also by district. Um, and you can, each one has their own profile page, which also has a timeline uh, as well as uh, shows you like how the, how the, the, uh, information's changed over time. Um, coming soon, uh, we're going to release shortly districts where you can see capital projects by clicking on a district, you can see all that district's capital projects, as well as um, their community board requests, city facilities in that district, um, city council discretionary funding related to that district. Uh, that's all there uh, and coming soon. So what's next? We're working with journalism students. We're working with elected officials. We're integrating other projects data. Um, we're trying to get to SimCity uh, for New York City and would love to work with you.
Much of what New York City looks like today is attributed to the work of a man who never held elected office and never received any formal training in architecture or urban planning. Robert Moses has been called the master builder of mid 20th century New York and its surrounding suburbs. Over the course of his four decade career, he built 700 miles of road, 20,000 acres of parkland and public beaches, the UN headquarters, the Central Park Zoo, and Lincoln Center, just to name a few. However, new large scale developments come with a price and not everyone pays the same amount. To actualize his urban renewal project, Moses had more than 500,000 people evicted. The construction of Lincoln Center alone displaced more than 7,000 working class families and 800 businesses. Moses was also known for wanting to keep neighborhoods and boroughs segregated. He especially hated the idea of poor people of color using the new parks and beaches he built on Long Island. To that end, Moses used his influence and connections to pass a law forbidding public buses on highways. But he knew laws could someday be, someday be repealed. Robert Moses famously said, legislation can always be changed. It's very hard to tear down a bridge once it's up. So that's exactly what Moses did. He built scores of bridges that were too low to let public buses pass. Decades later, the bus laws Moses fought for were eventually overturned. Still, the towns he built along the highways remain as segregated as ever. The reality is discriminatory decisions and policies of the past impact the present. Inequity affects and often informs the very design and fabric of our institutions. While everything has costs and benefits, these costs and benefits are not evenly distributed. When, today, when today's technology relies on yesterday's data, it will necessarily reflect the biased environment from which that data came from. Our technology will be doomed to mirror our past mistakes. And nowhere is this more problematic than in our criminal justice system. Today, AI is telling police which neighborhoods to patrol, analyzing forensic evidence in criminal trials, predicting whether someone is more or less likely to commit a crime, and even determining how long someone's prison sentence should be. To better understand the ways AI is used in law enforcement, we need to understand one of the most influential, violent, and racial theories of crime and policing in the United States, the broken windows theory. According to the theory, visible signs of crime and civil disorder, such as loitering, graffiti, prostitution, drug use, or subway fare evasion, sends a signal that a neighborhood is uncared for and encourages more serious crimes. In practice, the broken windows theory suggests that police should target minor crimes in order to prevent the more serious crimes. The theory influenced police practices like New York City's stop and frisk policy. Similarly, law enforcement's use of AI enabled tools is an outgrowth of broken windows policing and our country's history of tough on crime policies. An example of, law of a law enforcement tool that encodes a broken windows theory is predictive policing. Predpol is, most widely is the most widely used predictive policing out, um, system in the United States. It was first created as a result of a collaboration between the LAPD and a team of researchers led by a UCLA anthropology professor. They adapted a model that predicts earthquake aftershocks to try to forecast crime, specifically property theft. Using historical crime data, Predpol produces 500 square foot boxes showing where these crimes would most likely occur. The decision to go after property crimes was based on the notion that after one crime is committed in an area, more are likely to follow. If that sounds familiar, a Predpol best practices and training guide released via a FOIL, re FOIL request shows that the software explicitly embraces the broken windows theory of policing. Although over-policing has been shown to erode trust between law enforcement and their communities, particularly communities of color, Predpol takes the opposite approach, suggesting to use a software to seek out crime during officers' downtime. 
But if a computer is designating certain areas of, um, as crime hotspots, then sending police there primes officers to expect trouble or even seek it out when on patrol. This makes them more inclined to stop or arrest people in those areas based on prejudice rather than actual need. To forecast where crimes are most likely to take place, predictive policing systems rely on historical crime data. But law enforcement data, such as arrest data, says more about the priorities and practices of the police than about the people being arrested in the communities they are a part of. According to the Department of Justice, you are more than twice as likely to be arrested if you are Black than if you are white. A Black person is also five times as likely to be stopped without just cause as a white person. If targeting black people is standard police practice, then stops and arrests in their communities result in overrepresentation in law enforcement data, which systems like PredPol use to make their predictions. As this new data gets fed back into the predictive policing system, not only do discriminatory and unlawful police practices get baked into the data, but black, but black people continue to be targeted more and more. From the way I see it, predictive policing essentially manufactures crime rather than reduces it. As someone who has worked for organizations like the ACLU and the Legal Aid Society, I genuinely believe the law plays a valuable role in mitigating algorithmic bias and the use of dangerous technology like predictive policing. But litigation and advocacy are just one side of that coin. It's like Robert Moses said, legislation can always be changed it's very hard to tear down a bridge once it's up. Discriminatory police practices are not being codified in laws like they used to. Instead, those practices are being encoded in algorithms, then sold to police departments and us as fair and objective tools. Public interest technologists play an increasingly important role here. They must grapple with the history and systemic biases that infect these tools. As long as our criminal justice system is biased, so will predictive policing systems. If we don't scrutinize public facing technology and its objectives, it will learn from its environment through imitation without understanding why it works or concerns about the consequences. That's what machine see machine do is. The data our algorithms learn from is our history, our institutions, our decisions. We are the data. So we need to ask ourselves, what happens if AI is cemented in our daily lives before its flaws are fully addressed? One way or another, our response to the widespread use of biased technologies will determine whether hard-won civil liberties endure or become forgotten relics. The tech industry continues to create, market, and sell flawed products as long as only certain groups are impacted, and the government tolerates these flaws so that it can continue to rely on private sector technology to augment the police and surveillance state. The fight against bias technology will require the same energy as any other fight against systems of oppression. If we are not willing to reflect on the effects of our history, then our technology will simply continue to mirror our past mistakes. History will be doomed to repeat itself, but it will also become increasingly more challenging to see that. We cannot let that future come to pass. Thank you for joining my presentation today. If you found this topic interesting, I suggest checking out my upcoming book, Machine See, Machine Do, which will be published in December. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to talk with you today about some research that we're doing as part of Good Systems, a UT Grand Challenge. Hi, I'm Ken Fleischman. I'm a professor in the School of Information at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm also the founding chair of Good Systems, a UT Grand Challenge. Good Systems is one of the three research grand challenges as part of the Bridging Barriers Grand Challenges. These are moonshot goals they bring together researchers from dozens of disciplines 
um, to uh, address issues of major impact affecting our world. And they were all done in a bottom-up fashion. So groups of UT researchers came together to propose ideas that then were grown into from the bottom up uh, research grand challenges. So as the president announced at the State of the University address in 2019, Good Systems, the third Bridging Barriers Grand Challenge will work to ensure that the needs and values of society drive the design of artificial intelligence technologies. The collaborating units within Good Systems, the UT Grand Challenge are um, listed here. You can see um, the School of Information, of course, where I'm a professor, but also a wide range of units um, from the Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is our supercomputer center, one of the leading ones in the world, to the UT libraries, um, from the Department of Computer Science, um, to the LBJ School of Public Affairs, um, from the Walker Department of Mechanical Engineering, to the Moody College of Communication. So you can see uh, almost every unit across campus is, is represented as part of the 150 plus research team members of Good Systems, a UT Grand Challenge. So it's exciting to um, have helped to form such a interdisciplinary convergent research collaboration with such tremendous cross-campus impact. And I think this is the way um, that public interest technology can really impact an entire campus. And hopefully the Good Systems ET Grand Challenge can serve as a model for other universities considering launching public interest technology oriented uh, Grand Challenge initiatives. Um, I wanted to talk about a few projects in the um, Good Systems ET Grand Challenge umbrella. So uh, the first is on the ethical, legal and policy implications of AI. Um, so we conducted interviews with AI researchers as well as with uh, legal and policy experts um, leading to um, an article that was just accepted for a special issue of AI and society, as well as proceedings papers in ACES and AI conference. Um, this is work that I did with Sherry Greenberg from the OBJ School of Public Affairs, as well as a postdoc, uh, Steve Sloda, and our students and our collaborator at uh, Cisco, Chris Jennifer. And it's really um, exciting uh, to get to work closely with Cisco um, on this research to understand and, and to see that Cisco really cares about the future of AI and is interested in helping to make the world a better place. We had a similar experience working with Microsoft Research on the Microsoft Ability Initiative. So this was a project led by Donna Grari um, and um, Abby Stangle, uh, Nitin Burma and uh, Rachel Simons and Mary Morris uh, was our main uh, Microsoft collaborator. Um, and so this is led to uh, CSW and assets uh, papers, as well as a civic uh, futures uh, designing for the 100% award for our uh, work in uh, vision to language systems that empower uh, people who are blind or have low vision to uh, get a better understanding of their visual surroundings. Another project is uh, AI, equity, and homelessness. Um, this is a project that uh, Sherry Greenberg, again from LBJ School of Public Affairs, uh, Min Kyung Lee, and Steve Sloda, both from the I School, also uh, Tara Zimmerman, my postdoc, um, and our collaborators at the city of Austin. So this has been a, a one of this is one of seven research collaborations last year between Good Systems and the city of Austin. Last year it was funded by Good Systems as um, uh, part of our research funding. So in our first two years, we awarded a million dollars in, in research funding each year. This was one of the 11 projects that would fund, was funded. And again, seven of them were in collaboration with the city of Austin. And for this year, we actually are funded uh, directly by the city of Austin through the interlocal agreement between the city of Austin, University of Texas at Austin. So inter, this interlocal agreement uh, facilitates um, uh, research collaborations, whether in terms of funding or data sharing or many other forms of collaboration between the city and the university. This form of interlocal agreement is really important part of being able to uh, connect um, local government and universities uh, for public interest technology. 
And um, the work that we uh, did within Good Systems was credited as one of the contributions to the signing of this interlocal agreement between the city and the university. So we're pretty proud of, of that contribution. And this has led to papers at ACIST and APATMS. It was also recognized um, in July 2020 as the Metro Lab Innovation of the Month. Um, so we're really excited about this project, which uh, we are leveraging AI and data science to um, identify opportunities uh, to better serve people experiencing homelessness and to empower people experiencing homelessness with more information about the services that are available. Um, another project actually directly funded by the Public Interest Technology University Network. Um, this is part of the first network challenge um, was a conference, Informatics Education 2020, that we hosted in Austin, Texas. Um, and we had representatives from 30 universities, um, many of whom are uh, uh, current or have since become and joined as members of PIT UN. Um, and it was just fabulous to have uh, the range of faculty across universities and disciplines represented, as well as uh, with uh, several participants from nonprofits from local government and uh, from industry as well. So it's really great connections. It led to many connections, especially with our uh, colleagues at Houston Tillotson University, which is the oldest university in the city of Austin and also a, a small liberal arts HBCU. And um, so we collaborated with Houston Tillotson and um, we created the Social Justice Informatics Faculty Fellows Program. And also, so Houston Tillotson, uh, City of Austin, two data science uh, and also social justice oriented nonprofits, Capacity Catalyst and Measure, collaborated with the UT Austin I School on the Social Justice Informatics Faculty Fellows Program. And um, so this has been a really exciting program across six, we had fellows uh, and organizers across six uh, schools and colleges at UT Austin across four departments at Houston Tillotson, across eight different nonprofits, as well as several departments in the city of Austin. And um, both these projects have flowed really nicely with our new um, undergraduate informatics major and our social justice informatics concentration at UT Austin, and also our growing research program in social justice informatics. So we're excited about having uh, social justice informatics grow as a field. We have a workshop actually as part of a better tech. We hope you'll uh, be able to join us that um, Angela Smith and Amanda Messino and I are organizing. Um, and then the last project I want to mention is on uh, smart hand tools. Um, so the idea here is um, for manufacturing or construction work, uh, instead of relying on automation and uh, robotics and, and uh, replacing the worker, instead we want to use AI edge intelligence IOT sensing capabilities to empower workers to uh, embed the intelligence directly into smart hand tools that can give both real time and retrospective feedback to workers to help them improve their work um, and empower them directly. And this is uh, funded by both Microsoft and Good Systems CT Grand Challenge in collaboration with Raul Longoria and Mechanical Engineering. And again, Sherry Greenberg from LBJ School of Public Affairs. And we have many opportunities at the UT Austin I School. So our doctoral program is currently admitting students. We admit students who are either completing their undergraduate or master's degrees. The deadline is December 1st. Um, and we have a new NSF, NRT, and ethical robotics. Um, so there are many opportunities for funded, uh, as, uh, um, for student funding and for students to join the program. But that's a particular opportunity as well as any of these prior projects I've mentioned. And also we have faculty openings in um, health and social justice informatics, as well as in human-centered data science and user experience design. So whether you're a doctoral student looking for a faculty position or an undergrad or master's student looking for a doctoral program, please keep the UT Austin High School in mind. So uh, thank you very much. Again, I'm Ken Fleischman. I'm a professor in the School of Information. I'm also the founding chair of Good Systems and um, really uh, hope we'll get opportunities to connect at a better tech, especially at our upcoming workshop on social justice and products. Thank you very much.
Have you ever wondered about travel to space? I am sure many of us would be wondering about that and I am sure some of us would be travelling soon to space as a tourist. Tools and technologies are there to progress and preserve human values and ambitions. Space travel is just one such opportunity where it contributes to enhancing human ambitions. And uh, like you, I am also very excited in exploring such space travel. But will technology limit us? That is the important question. My name is Sundar Narayanan. Come along to discuss about the space travel limitation that may be caused by technology. And I am going to be specifically speaking about responsibility cards. Like I said, I am an ethics researcher who is focusing on controls, compliance and culture in an organizational environment to establish and evolve AI ethics and responsible AI. For you to become eligible for space travel, you are going to be using, the, 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 the organization is going to be using some kind of application and that application is going to be looking at ways to criteria wise list of people and filter out people who should be eligible for this process and let's say you were to be applying for it along with your spouse to travel to the space it may so happen that you are getting selected but your spouse is not getting selected a spouse application is getting rejected now this is the point of contention do you believe in this case the technology is limiting you and I'm sure you would agree that here we are not speaking about affordability of space travel. We are only speaking about technology limiting us. Again, I'm not speaking just about bias. I'm not generalizing bias. I'm speaking about a specific problem in bias which is contributed by pre-trained models. Pre-trained models are models that are trained with a specific data set but applied in different circumstances. Now there are broadly three types of pre-trained models that you can consider. One is large models similar to that of BERT, GPT-3 or the recently announced Codex. This is large models. This is also called as foundational models. Let's go into the second type. The second type is the number of APIs that are available. Now, when we are speaking about APIs, we are actually speaking about models that are already developed on a different data set and you are just leveraging the model and then using it for your limited purposes. The third category is um, a very important one which is about open source category which is uh, GitHub or other platforms where you have open sourced machine learning codes. If we are speaking specifically about GitHub, we need to understand that it has about 56 million users and about 190 million repositories. Now, 331,000 repositories are relating to machine learning alone. It's such a huge platform which contributes specifically to transfer learning. You are able to use a platform like GitHub for you to leverage on existing work and then extend it further. Researchers have extensively suggested that pre-trained models which are trained on public data sets or available data sets have bias embedded in them. And these bias embedding extends to further work that's been done and further references where it, these pre-trained models are used. Now, if we speak about bias, are we limited to data bias or are we extending it beyond? Practically speaking, the bias is not just limited to data bias. It will extend to even model bias. Now, what is a data bias? Now, when we are speaking about source data being biased for reasons that could be relating to the selection bias or it could be relating to availability or it could even be the, um, the choices that are made while model building in terms of use of data. Right? 
Then is the third part of it, which is the model bias part. The model bias is, uh, is about the choices that, the ethical choices that are made while building the model. A very simple example is uh, what you optimize a model for will make an impact on bias for the other, cat other categories or groups. There are so many cultural nuances in, uh, in the world, in different parts of the world and how these cultural contexts impact our life and how it impacts our belief system are profound. So these biases can hurt those belief systems. It is necessary for us to understand two important factors. There have been existing research uh, about having model cards and also having bias metrics. What is a model, model card? Model card is basically a way for somebody to represent the model and in a transparent way. What kind of representation are we speaking about? Now, model cards essentially contain multiple aspects. Model cards contain the primary source of data that is considered, the limitations relating to the source of data, the intended purpose of the model and the limitations relating to the model and what uses the model cannot be applied for. Right? Besides this, it is also going to cover aspects relating to the performance metrics, the achieved level of performance, the thresholds that are considered for the purpose of performance. There is the other side of it which is about bias metrics. Now there are multiple bias metrics that are available. These include bias metrics which are uh, for individual fairness, group fairness and even statistical parity as the case may be. The problem with model cards and bias metrics is that these are not complete. If you go ahead and then look at the APA um, based pre-trained models, if you go ahead and look at open source based pre-trained models or if you go ahead and explore uh, models which are um, large lab, large models or foundational models, you will recognize that these are, um, you do not have model cards in all the cases and in very, 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 very rare cases when you have model cards, they are incomplete. Given all these factors, I am here with proposing a normal approach which is a responsibility card. Now what is a responsibility card? Responsibility card is about looking at uh, multiple aspects of the model which will enable the developer to get a perspective of the pre-trained model before they are able to apply such pre-trained model to their model process. Now what are these factors? This may include model cards, this may include bias metrics. In addition, it's going to include several other factors. Some of it is what I'm going to highlight. And one of them is going to be incident report. It's going to give information on the historical list of incidents that have happened where the users have highlighted exceptions or um, uh, uh, instances where the model, model had erred on the edges. So those are what you're going to have in a responsibility card. Now this may appear a little overwhelming for some of you who would say that, oh my God, you're putting so much of stress on developers to bring in so much of information. Uh, how would it be possible? I, I have a simple question for you. Would you be investing in an organization, investing in a company where the company just shares with you its financial reserves, which are not audited, which does not have red herring prospectors, which does not have board report, which does not have any disclosures, would you be comfortable signing off or would you be comfortable investing in those companies? Why does this happen? It's because these information enable us to make more informed decision on actions which may affect us. And that's where responsibility card comes into play. Responsibility card is not a compliance tool. It is a tool which protects and promotes human values and ambitions. Thanks a lot for this opportunity.
Hi everyone, my name is Maz Gardezi and I welcome you to this presentation. I'm going to talk about reorienting the cultural tradition of innovation and governance in precision agriculture. So what is precision agriculture? Uh, it's considered to be a digital revolution that's taking place in agriculture, but also in many different sectors. Um, it's driven primarily by uh, big data, large data sets, um, the, the ability to collect data through remote sensing uh, and satellite imagery, um, the ability to use artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, as well as deep learning, and then the incorporation of various kinds of robotics um, or, or the interaction between AI and robotics. So precision agriculture can be considered as, as broadly as data-based farming decisions that are, that are explaining to farmers where and when they should plant, spray, um, and, and, and harvest, so those kind of decisions. Um, the reason why it's considered to be a game changer is because instead of, for instance, spraying on this entire piece of land, now you can identify specific areas that kind of need the most um, urgent um, you know, chemicals or, or, or pesticides. So for instance, you can reduce your overall uh, environmental footprint. Uh, at the same time, it's considered to be a game changer also because it allows um, greater economic productivity uh, and, and supposedly higher yields as well. Although, although that, that, that is contentious and still uh, kind of being debated. But while that debate takes place, um, a lot of countries, including the United States, is focusing on trying to get um, uh, most farmers uh, in the US and outside adopt some kind of precision agriculture technologies. And therefore it's, a, it's becoming increasingly a national as well, as well as a global priority. So the way I and my colleagues think about precision agriculture is that it is really at this intersection of these three systems. So you have the social system, which includes people, groups, and the rules that govern our behavior. Uh, so for instance, laws and regulations. And then you have the cyber systems that includes um, things like data sets, um, models, uh, algorithms, uh, software. So kind of the, the, the software needs that allow you to um, you know, process data, collect data, those kind of things. And then you have the physical environmental systems. Those include living organisms all the way from the very small microbial communities that are found in farming systems and soil. Um, but also to, to very large plant biomes. So various kinds of environmental systems com are composed in this physical environmental system. So precision agriculture is really at this intersection of the social, cyber, and physical system. So the, the ideas I'm gonna present today are coming out of this very large grant that I'm running uh, with various other folks from different institutions. Uh, we have, I'm a sociologist, but we have computer scientists and engineers working with us. Um, we also have, um, you know, people who actually work with farmers like extension agents and crop advisors, uh, but we also have uh, partners in the private sector as well as in nonprofits. So a very transdisciplinary project that's come about. And the goal of this project is to think about how can we reorient just exactly the topic of this uh, presentation. How can we rethink what innovation is in precision agriculture? How can we co-design some of these technologies so that they're more um, accountable to the people who are actually using it? How can we design some new policies so that we can think about how these innovations can also be responsive to the future implications? And then how can we also think about training and peer-to-peer and -peer knowledge sharing? So there are different ways in which we're imagining responsible innovation broadly. So I just want to present some broad strokes over here. So the first main idea is that precision agriculture in, in its various forms, whether it's a, it's a decision support system that's kind of making recommendations to farmers about their soil fertility or irrigation or whatever it is, I think it, it really needs to rethink about how do you connect nature and culture? Uh, because a lot of times uh, these kind of yield maps, the ones that you can see on the slides are created to kind of give a visual representation um, of reality, but they're not themselves are reality. So farmers have different ways in which they can validate this information, either by walking through their fields or scouting fields for insects or for other kind of pests. Um, but, but the idea being that precision agriculture broadly needs to kind of rethink ways in which nature and culture can be reconnected. Right now, it's kind of very much uh, based in this Cartesian duality where nature and culture are considered to be separate. So here's, um, you know, we conducted various workshops and here's a nonprofit um, a worker in Vermont who, who says the problem is that it's all about scale. 
the smaller farmers are interested in hands in the dirt, the larger farmers don't have the time, they don't have the capacity, they don't have any interest in doing that. So I think it's still important to think about what relationship farmers have with their land uh, and who are the people who would still like to get their hands dirty. And if they're, if they're, if that is true, then we, we should really think about including them in this innovation process as well. The second way forward is to think about how PA can um, not divide life or create hierarchies. And these can be social hierarchies, they can be plant-based hierarchies, but instead it should kind of try to really re reunite life and reunite some of these uh, different social differences. So currently the problem is that a lot of models that are being developed for precision agriculture, uh, whether it's for soil fertility or irrigation, uh, they're prioritizing very specific crops under very specific management practices and in very specific kind of biophysical conditions, right? And mostly those models are being trained on very large scale farms, so conventional farming systems, uh, industrial farming systems that are uh, practiced on very large acreage. The problem is that a lot of these models can be ineffectual for smaller farms. So this kind of creates these hierarchies where the models will create realities where some kind of farms will live and others will wither away. Um, so precision agriculture should really think more inclusively about how it's going to impact uh, various kinds of farming systems and farm sizes. The third thing, the way forward is to, is how can we think about precision agriculture that recouples farm workers with work, uh, but for sustainability, right? So right now, a lot of AI-based decisions are difficult to explain as a result of complexity of the machine learning algorithms. So it's difficult for farmers to actually validate whether the models are beneficial than what they're using already. So how can we intervene in this kind of a space when there's large uncertainties? Um, and uh, how can we use farmers, their own capacity for the purpose of innovation? So, so this brings us to this idea of co-design, a lot of ways in which we can bring in farmers and farm workers uh, into the process of design itself of these new technologies so that we can think about not just farmers individually, but how they collectively in, in various groups can help us transition towards sustainability. So basically what I'm saying here is that innovation we need some form of innovation that is not driven by these dualistic traditions, where separation is kind of an exception, not the norm, where design choices are influenced not only by a few experts, but really by diffused design experts, which means everybody kind of designs, right? The idea that Enzio Manzini talks about uh, in his book, where everybody designs. And then therefore the idea of designing itself is to acknowledge that people have different ways in which they can they make sense of their of themselves as well as their environment. And it's not just about solving problems, but it's also about sense making. So how can we design these different systems so that farmers can re-engage with nature, can get better connected to their environment, uh, but also to th themselves and their own identity as a farmer? So one of the ways in which this project is attempting to do this is by um, is, is through the core design process as well. So there are different ways in which core design can take place, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but some of the examples are, you know, you can use a ag tech or agriculture technology movie night where people, technology developers kind of, um, you know, collectively search for these various imagined futures. But you can also have farm workers play these games um, through virtual reality or augmented reality uh, headsets where they can actually be uh, given various situations uh, and they can be given uh, choices to make. And, and serious games are basically games that can help us learn about people, but also help us a little bit better in making policies uh, such as those that can be beneficial for farm workers. Um, and then finally, I would say that it's also important to involve a wide variety of people. And that's kind of given these days in, in social science research, uh, but it's important because a lot of times, um, you know, practical solutions require this kind of very large scale cooperation between various different sectors uh, and people having different interests. Um, but also it's important to understand that citizens or public in general should have the challenge to, um, can challenge the expert's authority. Uh, so the question of expertise is very much at the center of responsible innovation. I would like to thank you for watching this presentation. And if you have any uh, questions, you can always send me an email. Uh, my name is Maz. So my email is maz at bt.edu. I'm at Virginia Tech in the Department of Sociology. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Crystal Grant. I'm a geneticist and public interest technologist. I'll be talking today about health and clinical care and how it may allow for the automation of medical racism. So a quick primer on medical racism. Race is a social construct without biological basis, yet it is used to inform health and clinical care. Race-based medicine has its roots in eugenics, a pseudoscientific field largely used to further the myth of white supremacy. The field used incredibly unscientific methods to perpetuate myths that non-white people were innately inferior. Methods like attempting to measure differences in skull volume between races as proof of cognitive inferiority, the myth that non-white people were of overall weaker physical health, and the myth that non-white people were somehow immune from feelings of pain or perceived it differently. Um, this belief actually still persists today among medical students where a recent study found more than a third of them believe that black, their black patients feel less pain or seem to feel the pain differently than their white patients. Overall, one of the worst outcomes of the field of eugenics is that it's the effects that it has today on medicine and perpetuating the belief that there are extreme differences between the social races in terms of their biology and how they should be treated in medicine. I can dive a little bit more into the biology of race. Um, now, as a geneticist, there is not a biological basis of race. Race remains a social construct Yet, there are some biological and genetic um, underpinnings that are important in medicine that are not race. Race, unfortunately, is used as a bit of a lazy shortcut to these actually more important genetic and biological differences between patients. So the information in medicine that is actually useful is someone's genetics. And in the absence of this genetic information, Information about geographic ancestry can be informative in treating patients. Um, so it can be, it's known that among certain geographic areas, the, there are different proportions of um, risk for genetic diseases and, uh, um, and you know, increased prevalence. This is why this information is important. But flattening um, incredibly geographically diverse groups into single races is where you lose the important biological information. A great example is the continent of Africa. In a lot of American medicine, anyone from this continent or whose ancestors are from this continent are collapsed into one term, black. However, this is the most genetically diverse continent in the world. So two people from <laughs> plucked randomly from the continent would actually have a ton more genetic diversity than two people plucked from another area. Lumping them all as one term, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense biologically. And this is what I mean by using race in medicine, um, essentially kind of being a lazy shortcut when it comes to trying to infer biology. Whereas race is actually useful in, um, in determining how it might contribute to social determinants of health in which it can have very real effects. So I'll start talking now a little bit about the different kinds of algorithms used in medicine and how they look at these two um, different things, whether they're trying to infer biology or um, some social information and, um, uh, and their utility. Medical algorithms can have important implications in deciding who will receive care and what type of care they will receive. So the first kind of algorithm is kind of the one running along the top, where previous scientific literature, which suggests different treatments for patients by race, which as I just mentioned, doesn't quite make a lot of sense biologically, um, can have that um, have those suggestions in the literature essentially put into an algorithm, which is then used in clinical practice, and it might suggest different treatments for different patients. Another possible um, use of algorithms in medicine are using patients' electronic health records and feeding these into um, uh, some kind of like AI tool to try to make a prediction um, of who is likely to get sick and what kind of outcomes patients are likely to have. While both approaches are uh, currently used in medicine, both can also have their drawbacks. Um, for example, Electronic health records are 
known to reflect some of the social um, disparities among Americans of different racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. Um, because of previous, um, uh, essentially, discrimination and racism. As a result, electronic health records among certain groups like um, those of a so lower socioeconomic status, um, the unhoused, um, people who are um, unsure of their immigration status, and just generally um, non-white Americans in general, um, are often their health records are often a little bit more sparsely populated, and as a result, algorithms trained on them can sometimes have more errors. Um, similarly, these different groups can have differences in how much they spend on health care, and if not taken into account, these um, underlying differences between groups in the data, not driven by biology at all, can lead to differences in recommended treatments. And for the top example, with, scientific liter with a scientific literature suggesting that it finds differences between different races, this um, in of itself can be kind of questionable, especially when a lot of that um, literature maybe hasn't been repeated recently. Um, and this can lead to dispar uh, uh, um, disparate treatment between different races as they are literally suggested to be treated differently by doctors, sometimes um, to the detriment of certain races. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of the algorithms already in use. These medical algorithms have important applications in deciding who will receive care and what that care will be. So an algorithm that was in the news um, in the last couple of years similar to what I described, that used data from electronic health records to try to predict for hospitals um, which patients they should give extra attention to and who would need extra treatment, was found to be showing racial bias against black Americans because of other social factors, including how much different groups on average spent on health care. The algorithm learned that um, because um, black patients tended to spend less on health care, it assumed that this meant that they were healthier when in fact it was quite the opposite, we're, on, uh, we're um, through either past experiences of medical racism or as an acknowledgement of the previous um, atrocities in the country committed against people of color, a lot of um, black folks especially end up not going to the doctor until they are sicker. So not until this tool was being widely used by hospitals did someone notice, hey, this tool, instead of modeling who is sickest, is actually just modeling who can afford to pay for care. Similarly, uh, other research has found bias in tools used to decide which mothers should receive um, postpartum depression um, uh, counseling, as well as bias in the medical tools that claim to find biological differences between people of different races. Perhaps most alarming is a recent preprint that found that an algorithm that was trained to help in diagnosing patients has for some reason learned their race, racial identity, even without the doctors necessarily wanting the algorithm to. So it seems that there are different kinds of algorithms, those that have learned race by accident, those that were told it, and those that inferred it through other things like where a patient lives or uh, how much money, much money they could spend on treatment, it's clear that race is already in being encoded by these algorithms. So what can be done? Regulatory agencies can require that algorithms or other um, medical AI tools check for harmful racial biases and make this a part of that tool being cleared to, for use widely, whether commercially or specifically in the medical setting. The role of public interest technologists here is helping to push forward research into how to de-bias these tools once they're made um, by conducting some of this research that uncovers um, whether the tools are sorting and treating people um, differently based on their race. Hopefully together, um, regulators and public interest technologists can address this issue of race used in medicine to worsen outcomes for people of color and can encourage the more equitable use of tech. Hey everyone, uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to speak today at uh, A Better Tech. 
looks like a great event. Uh, my name is Christopher Tull, and the title of my talk for today is called Building a Public Interest Water Data Platform. And what I really want to do is tell a story about, um, about my organization, the California Data Collaborative, uh, and some of the work that we've been doing, uh, but also really to highlight uh, an idea that is helpful and is sort of core to some of the work that we do and that I think others working in public interest technology uh, might also find useful. So to start with, I want to sort of transport us back in time to 2014. At this point in time, the state of California was in the middle of a five-year drought, one of the worst droughts in the state's history. You can see a, a sort of snapshot of what that looks like here with Folsom Lake before the drought and in the middle of the drought. And at this point in time, the, the government of the state of California was sort of facing a problem. They wanted to manage water use across California, but they didn't really know how much water was actually being used. So what they did was to require each local water supply agency to start reporting um, how much water they use each month um, to the state. So now the state was building this data set. And, you know, fast forward a little bit to the spring of 2015, and things have not gotten worse. Uh, the winter was dry, and we enter, the, the state of California um, put into place these mandatory water, uh, uh, sort of what mandatory water cutbacks for all the water supply agencies in the state. And so what they did was they were using this, this new data set that they were collecting to say, hey, you, you used to use this much water. Uh, now you need to cut back 20% or you need to cut back 30% or maybe even more depending on um, which agency uh, they were you know, talking to. And so at this point in time in 2015, uh, I was just finishing up uh, my master's degree at the NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress. Uh, quick plug, you know, here's a picture of me at my graduation with my mom. And uh, I had returned to California when a buddy of mine uh, named Patrick Atwater, he sent me an email uh, and he was saying, hey, I've got some water supply agencies who, uh, you know, they're willing to put in a little bit of money, they're willing to contribute some data and they wanna try something new. Uh, and so that, that pilot project that we, that we started uh, has grown uh, today into the California Data Collaborative. We're now a nonprofit coalition of water supply agencies. You can see our, our current membership over here on the right, uh, representing agencies throughout the state. And we operate, you can think of us sort of like a, a trade association, but instead of focusing strictly on water use efficiency or strictly on how to manage a sewer system, uh, we really focus on data. And in particular on data management, data science, uh, and data for, for policy uh, to inform water management here in California. So I joined Patrick for this, for this adventure. <laughs> At the time, it was, uh, it was a bit of an experiment. And we dove into the contentious, um, sort of sometimes arcane world of California water. And we did a lot in those, those early years um, but one of the ideas that we sort of hit on during our, our learning and our research, and that has sort of stuck with us as a framework um, for our work continuing to this day, is uh, a, mo a conceptual model and a lens to think about um, regulatory reporting data. So that this may have applications, probably has applications for other areas of government, but in the context of water supply, uh, so Let's think about the state of California. If you're one of the state water agencies, your job is to use the tools at your disposal, which is often regulation, to um, really try and ensure a reliable, safe, clean water supply for every person in California. Big problem there is if you're uh, is that all the data or most of the data um, about whether the water is safe, clean, how much is being used. It's all maintained by the local water supply agencies that are actually on the ground um, maintaining the pipes and delivering water to people's homes. 
So if you want to be the state, you want to manage the state, uh, the water supply of, Cal of the state of California, um, you, and you, but if you need data, you need to request that data. Um, you need either voluntarily or you, you make it mandatory. And I, I've already given the example of this monthly water use reporting, but there are a lot of these reports. <laughs> uh, they cover the whole spectrum from water quality to groundwater to you know, water use, water loss, um, water management planning. There's this whole suite of reports, uh, but they often end up being sort of extra, uh, at, at least extra from the perspective of a local water supplier. You know, their, their core mindset, their core mission is keeping the pipes working, keeping the water clean, keeping water coming out of taps. Um, but then there are these additional requirements to gather a lot of data, to put this data in the right format and send it to the state so the state knows how to use it. And for a number of reasons, um, both, you know, on the state side in terms of, there, you know, there's some, some confusion and, you know, that some of the definitions could be clear. Uh, on the local side, there's, um, you know, there's sort of staffing difficulties. The, many of these folks are, they're engineers, they're technicians, they're not data scientists. Um, so some of the data could be better. It's not always the, the cleanest. But even more important is one of these, is what we re sort of recognize as a gap. And that's this, in this diagram, it's this bottom line here, which is local water suppliers do a lot of work gathering data and preparing data um, that only serves the purpose of you know, providing information to the state. But what do they get in return? And so this is a, it's really a question of misaligned incentives. And so one of the things that we are hoping to do is to see, is there a way that, you know, acting as a nonprofit data platform that we can sort of sit in the middle of this transaction and help to align those incentives? And so one of the ways that we can do that is to make it easier for local water suppliers to provide data into the data platform. We can work with the data that comes straight out of their billing systems or is the, whatever the data format that they're already working with and make it easy for them to get data into the platform. You know, they don't have to play data scientist and run summary statistics and calculations themselves. But almost even more importantly, uh, we can close the loop and provide something of value back to local water suppliers. We can provide data management tools um, you know, advanced data analysis to really help them understand their, um, their, their district, understand their system, and help them manage their operations. And we think that we can even provide value to the state through improved data accuracy, because you know, unlike local water suppliers, we are data scientists. Uh, we know data. And we think that we can also, there's also an opportunity to provide, to provide data and tools to the state as well. So we really have this vision of you know, closing this loop and creating this virtual data ecosystem um, that is, is much richer and hopefully more beneficial for everyone involved than, than the current state of things today. And this is really important uh, for a number of reasons. The first, one of those is that the state of California is in, in the middle right now of implementing their sort of version two of uh, collecting water use data and, and regulating water use in California. Uh, they call it making water conservation a California way of life. And it's a very complex, very data intensive piece of, of legislation, which means you need to have a lot of background, you need to have a lot of skills and a lot of data to really um, create accurate, accurate water use tar targets for local water supply agencies. And on top of that, uh, the whole Western US is moving back into drought. Uh, I have a, a screenshot here of the U.S. Drought Monitor from for California for the 30th of September, and big portions of the state are in exceptional drought. Uh, the governor of California has declared uh, drought emergencies in some of the counties in the state, and so in many ways it almost feels like that 2014 moment all over again. So uh, we think that we are pretty well positioned. We have a version one of our data platform. We have some funding for a version two, and we have a great team and a really enthusiastic supporters. So I'd encourage you to get in touch and you know, let me know your thoughts. I hope this was helpful and thank you for letting, inviting me to speak today.
Welcome everyone to this idea session of the Better Tech Fair. My name is Dorothy bauman Polly, and my colleague is Sarah kramer E. We're both affiliated with the NYU Stern Center for Business Human Rights and the Geneva Center for Business Human Rights, two institutions at business schools that focus on the human rights um, aspects of business models. And in the context of Better Tech, we're really happy to be part of this event because the human rights aspects of better tech are often overlooked. In today's idea session, we want to take you to make a deep dive with us into the cobalt supply chain from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Cobalt is a critical battery mineral that powers our electronics and our um, electric cars. These um, electric cars are a key component in the strategy uh, towards meeting climate change targets. So certainly a key component for better tech, but the cobalt supply chain comes with a number of human rights risks. Sarah, over to you. Okay, thank you, Doro. So as Doro um, already alluded to, cobalt is a key component in, our, in rechargeable lithium ion batteries that we use in our laptops, smartphones, and also electric vehicles. And the rise in cobalt demand in the next um, decades will predominantly be a result of the rise in e-vehicle sales. And unlike any other metal, cobalt offers a long lifespan and high energy density, which determines um, how long, how far um, a car, a single charge can power an electric car. The demand for cobalt is expected to surge fourfold by 2030, which means that automakers such as Tesla, BMW, Volkswagen, Volvo, and also electronics manufacturers, very well-known brands like Apple, Samsung, and LG will all need cobalt to manufacture their products, at least in the near future. Um, and they will all have to come to the DRC, um, while there are some exceptions I'll speak um, in, in short, uh, shortly. More than half of the world's cobalt deposits are located in the DRC um, in the African um, Copper Belt region, also known as Katanga. And as you can see from the size of the flags here, uh, for each cobalt producer, the DRC's uh, cobalt reserves and uh, production capacity is unparalleled. All other cobalt producing uh, countries are very unlikely to cover um, the demand, the rising demand for cobalt in the, um, in the coming years. To be exact, the DRC um, cobalt reserves could, um, are 51% of the world's cobalt reserves. And in terms of global cobalt production, the cobalt that comes from Congo um, is, accounts for more than 70% of the world's cobalt. So, and all the other cobalt producing countries each account for less than 5%. So it's um, unparalleled. And these two facts also uh, demonstrate that companies that need rechargeable batteries um, will depend on Congolese cobalt, which means that they will either directly or indirectly source from the DRC. It can be through Chinese processors, uh, producers, um, but it will come uh, very often from the DRC. Can companies avoid the DRC? Well, some like BMW are currently sourcing from Morocco and Australia. Others like Tesla are investing in cobalt-free technologies, uh, battery technologies, but uh, they continue to buy cobalt from the DRC. Also completely bypassing the DRC production will be unachievable given the scale of cobalt required in the future, but also it's very undesirable from a social development perspective. And that's because in many resource-rich um, developing countries like the DRC, mining provides a livelihood for millions in rural and regional communities. And that's often in the form of artisanal mining or ASM. What's ASM? As opposed to large-scale mining, um, artisanal and small-scale mining, ASM refers to mining without the use of heavy machinery. And it's basically just independent miners, Congolese, using basic tools and bare hands, digging tunnels that can be up to 90 meters deep um, to reach and extract minerals. And it's a very, very um, dangerous activity. ASM is the workforce of the mining sector. And in fact, um, in the DRC, up to 30% of um, the Congolese production comes from artisanal uh, mines or artisanal miners. There are approximately 40 to 100 million artisanal miners globally. And in terms of the DRC, there are one to two million Congolese that depend directly or indirectly on the production of cobalt. And there is no diversified economy in this part of the DRC, which means that there are no other jobs. With no alternatives, mining is the only way to earn a decent salary for people desperate to feed their families. 
Here on this slide, on the left side, you see artisanal mining activities. And on the right side, you see a, an industrial mining zone. But that doesn't mean that this industrial mining zone is from artisanal mining. In fact, because, because there are proven cobalt reserves in an industrial zones, um, artisanal miners are more likely to go and um, you know, enter unauthorized these concessions because it's more lucrative. They don't have to look for, spend time, waste time on um, looking for cobalt. Mining is a very dangerous activity, as I said, and it does not require formal training. Anyone with a hammer and a hook and the physical strength can mine. And a dangerous sector like artisanal mining poses many human rights risks. And that's what Dora will talk about um, on the next slide. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. So you just learned that for companies in need of cobalt for their batteries, either in electronics or in autom automotives, they will not be able long term, given the growing demand, to avoid the DRC or to avoid cobalt coming from artisanal mines. These pictures are from Amnesty International and the human rights risks in the cobalt supply chain, particularly in those artisanal mines, are well documented. Key risks include mine safety issues because those tunnels that are dug by hand, they can easily collapse. There are regular fatalities and injuries but also um, children are sometimes supporting the activity as you can see on the picture on the left, um, but sometimes they're also just playing on rather dangerous um, mine sites. Um, and to ensure that human rights standards are respected in the supply chains requires concerted efforts of all stakeholders in the supply chain. Um, to better understand what strategies could look like, I actually went to the DRC in September 2019. Um, again, I went there not to violate, to, to record and document violations. I think uh, others have done that brilliantly. Um, I wanted to understand what kind of strategies can be developed to address these human rights risks. And I see two ways forward. Um, one uh, way forward, I would call this formalization of artisanal small scale mining sites. Um, while I was in the DRC, I actually analyzed a pilot project that was spearheaded by a Swiss commodity trading company called Trafigora, um, where they tried to establish standards um, and monitor those standards at an artisanal mining site. Um, on a concession from which they sourced exclusively. The site was called Motoshi and this pilot experience actually led uh, a, a state entity, the Entreprise Générale du Cobalt, to release so-called responsible sourcing standards just this year. So it's a pilot project that fully translated into more common standards for all artisanally mined cobalt from the DRC. Another um, strategy is building upon this formalization uh, experience, namely multi-stakeholder platforms that as a collective want to ensure that these standards are now mainstream beyond um, individual companies. And uh, we are members of the Global Battery Alliance and there's a sub-initiative called the Cobalt Action Partnership and together with over um, 60 other stakeholders from companies and civil society and academia, we're now thinking about how can we establish responsible sourcing standards um, for the entire cobalt industry. So uh, in conclusion, um, we believe now is the time to act. We need to develop sustainable solutions to human rights issues in the battery supply chain. After all, we need those electric cars um, to meet climate change targets. And it's also clear that the transition to green energy must be environmentally and socially responsible. Those two dimensions of sustainability are inextricably linked and we need to pursue them in parallel. Um, on this next slide, you can see our publications related to this topic, starting with our research report published in the WEF White Paper series, making mining safe and fair. And based on this research report, we have written for practitioners journals and also um, op-eds in different outlets. So you can find a lot more information on our websites, um, NYU and also the Geneva Center. The contacts are on the final slide. I thank you for your interest um, and uh, look forward to your thoughts on this. Hello, everyone. 
You are here because you care, because you believe in responsible tech, because you care about technology ethics, because you want to make a difference and solve today's most complex challenges. And I'm here today to give you an idea, to tell you that the Master of Engineering degree in Engineering, Law and Policy, MELP, is the right degree for you. So whether you are a scientist, an engineer, or a technologist, a student or a professional with a STEM background, this degree is for you. When we think about technology, we think about enabling innovation. Design provides the method and framework to ensure that what we make can be used and will be used. And law and policy provide the opportunity for empowerment and implementation. And all these aspects are necessary to solve today's most complex challenges. So as we think about our world today and all the different challenges we face, whether it's climate change, healthcare, energy demand, they all require us to think about engineering, having a framework where we look things from a systems perspective, law, as well as policy. Most of today's challenges are at the intersection of technology, law, and policy. We need an interdisciplinary approach and we need to have the skills that allow us to be able to really move within these three disciplines. And that's what this Master of Engineering degree, a professional degree, can offer you. Now, as we think about global challenges, let's look at the Sustainable Development Goals. All our complex problems all require an interdisciplinary approach. And that's what we want to offer you at Penn State University. Penn State is a land-grant institution, 24 campuses, in the state of Pennsylvania, one single university. And at Penn State University, we also have the biggest alumni network, fee paying in the world. This is a network of alumni that are here to support you. Within the College of Engineering, we have an ecosystem for you to succeed from career services to our global programs and our support for international students to world-renowned faculty. At the School of Engineering Design, Technology and Professional Programs, which is the department that houses the Master of Engineering, we're gonna provide an ecosystem for you to succeed. So this school, which we refer to as SETAP, we empower change makers. We're innovating at the intersection of disciplines. We're pioneering. And we promote diversity, equity, and inclusion as a core value. We're also excited to share that our school will be moving into this building fall 2022, West 2. So you will be in state of the art facilities, maker space, design space, collaborative space, transparency. That's what this building conveys. And that's what you're gonna be a part of. Within this department, we have a series of programs across entrepreneurship, leadership, social innovation, engineering design, and law policy and engineering. You'll be surrounded in an ecosystem where interdisciplinarity is at its core. We have three master degrees. And I will be talking today about law policy and engineering the recent degree that we just launched. So law policy and engineering is an initiative across the College of Engineering, Penn State Law, and the School of International Affairs. This initiative seeks to really create a new carter of engineers and scientists versed and fluent in policy and law. Also, the next generation of global policy leaders versed and fluent in law and technology. And finally, the next generation of lawyers also fluent in technology and policy. 
Why? Because this interdisciplinary approach across these disciplines that integrate technology and social sciences is at the core of the skill sets we need to solve today's most complex problems. Now, the degree is a year long degree for full time study or two years part time study. It's residential at University Park in Happy Valley. That's what they call State College in Pennsylvania. And this degree was developed very intentionally. So it has at its technical core, a focus on systems design and systems thinking. Then we have courses that are provided by Penn State law, foundations in public law and private law with a science and technology emphasis. We have a course on science, technology and international policy provided by the School of International Affairs with a focus both on international, but also domestic and local policy. And then we have two interdisciplinary courses that were created so that the engineering and technology scientists are in the same classroom with the law students and the policy students, because this is what happens in real life. And these courses are engineering law and policy systems and engineering law and technology policy practical. Now, through the electives, a student can really tailor this degree, whether you're interested in a deep dive into a technical area or want to really further your policy or your regulatory and compliance skills, we will build a study plan with you based on your interest and your technical background. We will help you develop a plan of study so that you can really succeed and be ready to go out there into the world. Now, as I mentioned, there's nine technical elective focus areas. These include energy, environmental, nuclear energy policy and nuclear security, computer and network security, autonomous vehicles, telecommunications, biology and agriculture, nanotechnology and advanced manufacturing, and biomedicine and healthcare technologies. As you see, it's very broad in areas, and this is intentional because this degree is relevant across any engineering major or any background in STEM. Because today's grandest challenges require not only being excellent in your technical skills, but at the same time, understanding how the policy and regulatory framework of the technology, of those especially emerging technologies, of what that looks like. And so that's what we wanna do here with this degree. Now, career opportunities are gonna be also quite broad because the advantage of the, the degree like this is that these type of skills, your technical knowledge, and in addition, knowledge and understanding and analysis and policy and regulatory affairs, it's gonna be quite welcome and it's gonna give you a competitive edge whether you want a career in government or industry, nonprofits, national labs, or the many other opportunities listed here. The reality is there's a lack of individuals that have the knowledge to bridge across policy and technology, across regulatory affairs and technology, and across all these three together. That's what makes this degree very unique. Also at Penn State, we're gonna provide you with the ecosystem so that you can succeed. First of all, the Penn State Science Policy Society student organization is there working at the intersection of these topics. Also, Penn State is part of the Public Interest Technology University Network, one of 42 universities at the moment. Also, our Penn State Outreach Office has the Nittany AI Alliance. This is a program for AI for Good campus-wide that has an annual competition, but also that have internships across big tech and nonprofits. And we also have the evidence to impact collaborative, bringing forth that science policy communication piece, which is so important, bridging our research with our policymakers. So I wanna encourage you to visit our website. You'll see here through the QR code, it will lead you to it. There's also an email, lpe at engr.psu.edu. Visit us and learn how to apply today. We're open for applications for both spring and fall 2022.
Welcome to Compensation in the Tech for Good and Nonprofit Sector. I'm Shelley Kurtz, and I'm from X for Impact, the leading data insights, research, and advisory services company for social innovation in the U.S. For more information, I invite you to join us at x4i.org, where you can find free resources, interactive reports, and Tech for Good services and products to inspire you about future places to work. Our data is based on analyzing over 3 million filings with the IRS based on nonprofit organizations and private foundations. Every two weeks, our team of analysts updates this data and provides it at x4i.org. The nonprofit sector in the US is a tremendous ecosystem with over a million nonprofit organizations making up over $3 trillion in annual revenues. That's bigger than the enterprise software as a service industry globally. What you may not realize is that over 75% of revenues actually come from products and services, not from charitable donations. One of the interesting facts about the leadership differences is that many nonprofit organizations are led by women in the smaller stages, which is an exciting movement towards diversification in the field. However, we still have some work to do in the gender gap on pay equity. We still make 17% less than our male counterparts. We'll unpack some of the details. But the great news is that there is a very small difference between nonprofit salaries and the private sector, which may surprise most people, thinking that you need to do pro bono work or take an extreme pay cut to do the work you love. Today's workforce is very dynamic, made up of individuals who are open-minded, passionate about social issues and causes from climate change to animal welfare, and connected 24-7 through mobile devices. But we need to understand some of their motivations. They're burdened with debt, with the average student loan being $36,000 and our annual debt totaling over $1.4 trillion as a nation. Beyond financial considerations, they also want to have purpose. And especially during this pandemic, we can all relate to wanting to have meaningful reasons to connect over the internet and with colleagues doing work that is aligned with our values. But the question is, can new grads do work that offers both money and meaning? Let's take a look. The nonprofit sector is comprised of many different facets. The top of the pile in terms of the revenue leading the number of organizations is in healthcare and education. Many hospitals are structured as nonprofits as well as community health plans and other organizations focused on good health and well-being, SDG number three. But there are a variety of other types of organizations, even including financial institutions like private unions that you may not think of as being part of the nonprofit sector. From a compensation perspective, there's actually quite a lot of parity with the private sector in terms of specific roles that pay much more than your parents may think. So when you're looking to make a meaningful impact in the nonprofit sector, you don't necessarily need to trade off salary and other benefits. In fact, in some roles that are emerging in influence, such as software development roles and data science work, there is an opportunity to actually make more in the nonprofit sector than competing opportunities in the private sector. Location matters for nonprofit salaries, as well as the size of the organization. The Northeast offers the best opportunities for increased compensation. And for executive salaries, DC leads the way, while West Virginia leads in non-executive salaries. The gender gap is something that unfortunately we need to come to terms with as a global economy, but even more so when we look at some of the impact it has on the US. Here in the US, the women make up almost half of the workforce and yet only 6% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies are women. And we still only make 81 cents on the dollar when you look at overall opportunities in the US. When we look at the nonprofit sector specifically, 
the gap still exists, although there are some emerging trends that are very promising. New nonprofit organizations and smaller organizations have a very small gap, while larger organizations in the enterprise category with revenues over $50 million a year have more work to do. Overall, the total median compensation for women in the nonprofit sector looking at all of the salaries reported in IRS filings is over $110,000. Men typically make a bit more at $133,000 and change. Let's work to even out the balance sheet. We have some compensation resources I'd love to share with you. We have a free downloadable white paper available at X for Impact, which shows the trends and data among the winners and losers and different job categories and organizational sizing, along with some of the emerging titles in technology for good roles. We also have created an interactive report that provides on-demand access to custom data, looking at a variety of factors from the specific impact area, such as youth development, uh, all the way to the size of the organization and the specific job title and geographic region. We have a special offer for those of you attending this webinar that provides this full annual subscription for just $49 so that we can incentivize more job seekers to look for opportunities in the tech for good sector and in the nonprofit space. When we look at some of the resources we have inside the tool, you can see it's a very comprehensive overview of a variety of different factors showing the salaries by total compensation percentages, along with the titles that are most paid in the sector, along with some of the nuances of benchmarking and the gender gap. All of the data is transparent and fully available to show you where it's coming from. Over the last two years, about 98% of the data uh, has been reported and every two weeks we continually update that data set and so it's continually moving forward into the most recent most current data available for nonprofit compensation and you can see that there's quite a range of organizational sizes in the nonprofit sector which has a big impact on the salary organizations that are in the enterprise sizing over 50 million dollars a year operate much more closely to their Fortune 500 companions in the private sector. You may not realize there are over 6,000 organizations like these. So when you're looking to compare and benchmark, you wanna make sure that you understand whether or not you're comparing to the smaller organizations which have much more limited budgets or larger organizations uh, which can be more competitive and aligned with the general market. We also have a collection of tech for good resources that we hope will inspire you. Many of the tech companies featured in our directory are structured as nonprofit organizations, which is a little known nuance uh, that you can in fact uh, work in software and technology and also be working for a nonprofit. If you wanna explore a specific issue area, such as good health and well-being under SDG number three in the global goals, you can see that there are over 280 tech solutions and you can further filter those by those that are hiring currently or led by someone in a diverse role uh, within the organization. And lastly, whether or not that organization is structured as a nonprofit. Lastly, we wanna make sure that you know that this is a big market opportunity. Nonprofit roles are no longer small social sector uh, volunteer opportunities. This is a healthy ecosystem with many opportunities for compensation and career growth. It's attractive to those looking for meaning and the ability to pay the bills. The compensation is competitive for many roles and has an opportunity to create even greater pay equity. And lastly, that you should also consider tech for good companies that are structured as nonprofits and those who serve nonprofits, even from the private sector, as a way to scale sustainable solutions for social impact. We hope that you have been educated on some of the salary differences in the sector and that you will join us 
in your research and your exploration of the opportunity at x4i.org. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brittany Moore, and I'm a manager on the federal workforce team at the Partnership for Public Service, a nonpartisan nonprofit working to make government run more effectively and efficiently. Today, I will be sharing information on the Cybersecurity Talent Initiative, a cross-sector employment opportunity for recent graduates in cybersecurity. The Cybersecurity Talent Initiative addresses the cyber talent deficiency across the U.S by building the next generation of cybersecurity leaders. The program also addresses the rising student loan debt crisis. The program's corporate partners include MasterCard, Microsoft, and Workday. The Partnership for Public Service serves as the operating partner, while CyberVista supports the program by providing in-kind technical training to program participants. A list of our program Participating agencies are also included on the slide. The Cybersecurity Talent Initiative is a cross-sector program aimed at recruiting and training entry-level cybersecurity professionals. The program is for students in cybersecurity-related fields who wish to gain public and private sector work experience. Program participants work at a federal agency for two years where they receive salary and benefits before being invited to apply for positions with one of the private sector companies and receiving up to $75,000 in student loan assistance paid out by those corporate partners. Program participants also receive quarterly leadership development workshops, technical training from CyberVista, and will be mentored by a cyber leader from the public or private sector. This program brings in talent into the federal government at the GS 7, 9, and 11 levels. The application for the program is currently open, and those selected would enter their full-time positions in the summer or fall of 2022. Our first two cohorts beat national averages for diversity across cybersecurity roles, with 25.8% of participants identifying as female, and 22.1 identifying as Black or African American, compared to 15.2 for the national average. It's also important to note that our applicant pool had a large representation of individuals from online schools, and many of those candidates were non-traditional students and second career learners. Here's a snapshot of a couple of our cohort one participants. Manpreet is a recent graduate of the University of Albany, State University of New York, and is currently working at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and graduated with degrees in digital, forensics, emergency preparedness, homeland security, and cybersecurity. Kristen Lockwood is a graduate of John Jay College of Criminal Justice with a degree in digital forensics and cybersecurity and is working at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency within the Department of Homeland Security. To learn more about the Cybersecurity Talent Initiative or to apply by November 5th, visit www.cybertalentinitiative.org or send us an email at info at cybertalentinitiative.org.
to um, to our little talk here. My name is Michelle Shevin. I'm joined by my colleagues, Matt Mitchell and Cynthia Conti-Cook. Um, and we are tech fellows at the Ford Foundation, or I should say I am a former tech fellow at the Ford Foundation. So we're here to just give you kind of a quick um, overview of what the tech fellows at Ford are, who, who each of us are. We represent about half of the current cohort of tech fellows. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about that program, but also I think um, a, a little bit about our pathways into this, this line of work. Uh, and that's probably about all we'll have time for. So as I said, my name is Michelle Shevin. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I have been at Ford since, let's see, summer of 2017, when I joined a team that at the time was called Youth Opportunity and Learning. And uh, I came into Ford um, with a background in kind of strategy and innovation consulting. I worked for a couple of different sort of boutique consulting firms, um, one called Strategic Business Insights out in California, and one called Luminary Labs in New York City. Um, and these were organizations that really looked at the sort of intersection of technology change, social change, regulatory change, other types of change to sort of see the horizon and say, okay, what's kind of next for the, for the innovation community, for the business community, even for the government, you know, regulatory community or government intelligence community. So looking really across sectors to sort of try to either, you know, predict not through computational means, but through uh, very human uh, qualitative approaches, try to sort of chart out what might be next and, and what uh, signals and, and changes that, that um, different stakeholders would need to need to pay attention to. So this ended up setting me up, I think, pretty well um, alongside my kind of academic background, which is in anthropology and, uh, and security studies, um, to, to take on a role as a tech fellow. And really the tech fellows program at Ford is an effort to embed sort of strategic 
uh, technical capacity in each of Ford's program areas. So as I said, I started on a team called Youth Opportunity and Learning, made my way over to the technology and society team, and now I'm actually serving as um, a program officer, senior program manager of the Public Interest Technology Catalyst Fund. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Matt. You're muted, Matt. Hi, I'm muted. I'm a tech fellow, but I have problems with things like mute. Um, well, listen, I am a tech fellow in this program. I'm with a team called Build. And, you know, if you're at a career fair and you're saying, okay, Ford Foundation's hiring, what's going on there? What am I going to be doing there? The job is you. The job is you. The job is I'm someone with a tech fellow program specifically, but anything uh, at Ford here, uh, that's involved in this mission of fighting inequality, fighting poverty, pushing for a more democratic world. And so with that said, uh, working in the nonprofit sector, does it mean that you will be um, losing out on professional development? It doesn't mean you'll be missing out on working in exciting opportunities that change this world and um, feed your soul, but also feed your, um, your, your bank account, right? Uh, it doesn't mean you're missing out on prestige and a platform. In fact, it means getting all of those things in huge amounts and we need you. So I hope from this video, you're like, you know, I'm gonna look into this whole thing, this uh, nonprofit industrial complex and realize that there are people out there uh, who are professionals who are doing amazing work um, and who are doing that work thanks to uh, philanthropies like the Ford Foundation. So uh, if anything, I hope this message is I should apply to nonprofits. I don't have to work at big, uh, sorry, I forgot what was the audio thing. I don't have to work in big tech necessarily. Um, I can work where my work has the most impact on this world. And Matt, tell us a little bit about like your pathway into Ford and what you do oh, yeah. aside from being a tech fellow. Uh, my pathway into Ford was, um, you know, I used to be a data journalist. I was working at the New York Times and I was really frustrated with my work because I didn't feel like I was doing enough. Uh, I had already been volunteering nights and weekends. I started this like nonprofit uh, anti-surveillance group called Crypto Harlem. And I was like, you know what? I want to do more. So I realized through asking around that there was this fellowship opportunity through Mozilla and Ford Foundation called the Open Web Fellowship. I got the Open Web Fellowship. It was like 400 or something applicants and they only picked nine of us. And I told myself, if you get that application, if you're one of the nine, you're gonna do this forever. You're gonna do this till the wheels fall off. Just figure out a way. And if you don't just, you know, go back into the, fall back into the corporate world and figure it out, you know, get that money. Um, and I got in and I've never stopped. And uh, that was um, maybe six, six, seven years ago or something. So look, at the end of the day, I worked in the private sector my entire career, but I cared about issues that the private sector doesn't necessarily put at the forefront. And now I get to work on those issues every single day with people who blow my mind. Like uh, when you're working with people like Conti, when you're working with people like Michelle Shevin, it just inspires you, it keeps you on your toes. So um, this is a dream come true and I wish I knew about it sooner. So please look into these opportunities in these spaces. This is for you. Thanks, Matt. And, and Cynthia, AKA Conti, tell us like, you know, you come from a different line of work. I think Matt and I both have some private sector experience. Tell us about your background and your journey into, uh, into the team that you now work at at Ford and tell us a little bit about what you work on at Ford. Thank you, Michelle. I work as a tech fellow on the Gender, Race, and Ethnic Justice Project at Ford. Basically, I work on translating technology to my team, which is focused on justice issues, whether that exists in the immigration movement space, the reproductive justice movement space, or in ending mass incarceration. And I also translate justice issues to our technology team. And so I think a, a technology translator, justice translator is sort of the easiest way to sum up what it is that I do here the most. How did I get here though? I would have never ever in a million years guessed that my career would lead me to anything with technology in the title of it. Um, I come from the 
background of being a civil rights attorney. I did private practice for eight years, basically just suing police and correction officers in New York City and New York State for misconduct. From there, I realized that there was a pattern that police officers were often, um, the same crew of police officers were often recommitting the same types of harassment uh, in the same communities. And so I started to track those groups of officers that led me to really want to be at a place like the Legal Aid Society, which is where I went next. And I went there to create a database of police misconduct. Now, as things go in the nonprofit world, when one person in a nonprofit sort of raises their hand and says, I'm going to learn a lot about this subject, for me, it was technology, suddenly you become the person that answers all the questions about that subject. And so I became, um, the person on whose desk everything technology related started to land. Uh, I do not have the, besides a certification course in data analytics, I don't have deep education or experience in technology itself, but have done quite a bit of analysis around what goes wrong in training data sets and how uh, various different types of technologies have unintended consequences. And that in a nutshell is who I am, what I do, and, and I think how I got here. I've been at Ford since 2019, um, and we have done a lot of work around educating my team uh, to get a little bit more fluent in issues related to technology, as well as doing a lot of sort of due diligence investigations into proposals that are made that involve technology at some level. Thank you both for sharing that experience. I think you know, the, the takeaway I hope for the audience is that it doesn't really matter what your starting point is, as long as you kind of center, you know, equity, justice, um, and, and, and other public interest values in the approach that you take to, to toward technology, um, you too can, can head toward uh, a, a position where you're really a strategic advisor, I think, at the level that, that we've all been able to, to provide to, to an institution like Ford. It doesn't have to be Ford. Um, but this is, you know, this, these intersections and that translation skill that, that, Matt, that Matt and Cynthia spoke about is so key and so needed in, in every sector and every industry right now. So um, I hope that this has given you a peek into a couple of the tech fellows at Ford. And uh, we look forward to just continuing to see where all of your careers go. Um, and I'm sure we'll come into contact with many people in the audience uh, in the future. So thanks again to my dear colleagues um, and fellow fellows. And uh, that's it from us for now. My name is Masha Danilova, and I'm a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow. And I'm here to talk to you today about the launch of the United States Digital Corps. The federal technology workforce faces an immediate and critical early career technical talent gap. Part of this challenge has been that historically, there was not a clear direct path into government for early career technical talent. In fact, I myself started as a student intern at the Department of Energy, but without a clear path into the federal space, I ended up pivoting into private industry for many years prior to coming back as a Presidential Innovation Fellow. Furthermore, with a workforce that does not yet reflect the full spectrum of diversity that exists in America, for example, only 25% of employees identify as women, those designing and delivering government technical solutions do not yet reflect the experiences and backgrounds of the people that we serve. We see this as a critical gap because a government that reflects its people will best serve the needs of its people. In collaboration with the Biden-Harris administration's White House, the Office of Personnel Management, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, the General Services Administration Technology Transformation Services has launched the United States Digital Corps just a few weeks ago in August of 2021. The U.S. Digital Corps is a brand new two-year government fellowship program that will recruit early career technologists from colleges and universities, certification and apprenticeship programs, boot camps, and other programs for those reskilling into technology careers, including our military veterans. It is critical for us that we don't only focus on recruiting efforts on conventional four-year programs, but expand to more unconventional pathways as well, 
so that we can more completely and accurately capture the diverse pool of backgrounds and experiences that we're looking for. This is an unprecedented opportunity to launch your early career in public service while working with us to create a more effective and equitable government. Because we are seeking technologists who have recently completed their programs, no prior full-time work experience is required. Though we would expect our candidates to, of course, have requisite knowledge and ability to apply technical principles, methods, and practices in the fields, including software engineering, product management, design, data science and analytics, as well as cybersecurity. The United States Digital Corps is building a deep, diverse, sustained bench for federal tech talent. The fellowships will be aligned to high impact work. They will be directly supporting the administration's priorities of coronavirus response, economic recovery, equity, streamlining government of services, as well as other high impact efforts across the federal space. The United States Digital Corps is strongly committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And we are thinking about this in every aspect of program design, starting from recruitment, where, when, how we recruit, our outreach, selection, as well as agency placement. Though with this program, the fellows will be embedded and placed across different agencies across the federal space. As part of the program design, we will have a central program office at Technology Transformation Service focused on offering end-to-end -end fellow support. The central office will offer a robust onboarding curriculum to ensure that fellows understand effectively government 101. We will also offer learning and development programs that will continue to further your education, both along technical as well as soft skill sets. And finally, we're going to be developing mentorship programs to ensure that every fellow has a safe space to ask the hard questions and to really set, be set up for success within this federal space. So we're really excited to announce, announce that applications for the first cohort of the U.S. Digital Corps will be opening this fall with fellows working in fiscal year 2022 at more than five agencies across the federal government. Our initial host agency list includes, but is not limited to, GSA, Veteran Affairs, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Check out our website on digitalcore.gsa.gov, that is D-I-G-I-T-A-L-C-O-R-P-S dot G-S-A dot gov, and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get the latest updates on the application process, when the application window will officially open, just to make sure you don't miss out. We're also on Twitter and LinkedIn as U.S. Digital Core. This program will change the makeup of government at scale. And as an early career technologist, this is your opportunity to be a part of that change. Mm -hmm.